Liza, will you please call the roll? Certainly. Katie Frisch? Here. Susan Roll? Here. Jonathan Nickel? Here. Dwayne Romero? Here. And Susie's in it. Here. Great. Thank you. You have quorum. Okay. Um, and we have public comment is the next item on our agenda. And I don't believe anyone has signed up. Is that right, Eliza? Correct. Um, but we do have to, yes, no one signed up. Okay. And so then I just um, will ask if anyone has joined the meeting and would like to speak at public comment. Okay. I don't hear anything. No. Um, all right. So I'm going to move on to um, the adoption of the agenda. Can I get a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? Uh, motion so moved. Second. <laughs> motion. Okay. I'll do a little roll call. Katie Frisch. Aye. Susan Marolt. Aye. Jonathan Nickel. Aye. Dwayne Romero? Aye. And Susie Zimmett? Aye. So moved. Thank you. All right. Um, 5.1 is our AEA update. Okay. Are you here? Are we moving too quickly? Um, why don't we go to, um, can we start with some administrator update, Dave? Yes, we can. Um, and we've got a number of updates. Um, I believe we were going to start with Dr. Art and then kind of cycle through. Uh, Adric? That works for me. Um, so this week I completed uh, the 2020-21 consolidated application for our title funds. If you recall, about a month ago, you guys approved uh, the, where we are going to be spending those monies. Um, starting next week, I'm going to be uh, working on our district comprehensive program plan. It's around our gifted and talented populations and what is our plan for the next three years to address uh, their unique needs. Uh, today, I had a meeting uh, with the mental health continuum. Um, this is the group of us as a school district, uh, the city of Aspen, public health, and the hospital who all combined it and brought money together to provide two full-time mental health providers in our school system to decrease barriers and increase support, the mental health support for our, our students um, here. Uh, that is for all students, um, and it is at no cost to our students as well. Um, I really like this great partnership that we have with them. So, you know, just learning more about it, working with these other people, it's great. Uh, also, um, this week we started supporting all of our students with disabilities in some form or fashion, which I think is awesome. Uh, I know there are still some wrinkles that we need to work out, um, but everyone's working hard and they're really enjoying their time with kids. It probably could be up in like 10, 15, 20 minutes. Can you just jump on your phone and listen in? And if everyone could please mute, if you're not actually speaking, that would be great. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Adric, sorry to interrupt there. Nope, it's all good. That's all I got, unless you want me to make up some more stuff. No, no, no need to make up any stuff. Uh, you're doing enough work as it is without making it up. Uh, Mr. Durham, I know your department's quite busy. He's so busy he can't speak. How about uh, Ms. Mahaffey? Could you talk to us about transportation? Yeah, I just had all of my buses return from our second day of running routes. Um, a little bit crazier on cohort B. We had about seven kids come back to school because parents weren't at stops, but you know, everyone was safe. The bus system seems to be working well. Parents really like the new parent communication app and seems to be going well. Transporting still a lot of little kindergartners, upwards of 300 of them. So <laughs> good times. Great. And, and just quickly off the top of your head, last year you could transport how many kids on a bus and this year, how many kids can you transport? So last year we were averaging around 55 to 65 kids per bus. 
Um, our buses are quite near where we set the capacity of 24. So we're averaging right around 20 to 23, 24 kids per bus. Great, thank you. Part of the challenge of transporting in the age of COVID. So thank you for that. Uh, Talita, can you say a few words about HR land? So since uh, August 15th, we hired a new counselor for the elementary school. We hired an art teacher for high school, a SPED teacher. Uh, we're still looking for math specialist, reading specialist, and SPED teacher for the middle school. We advertise in our Denver Post. Um, we are working with the subs. We are making progress. Uh, we can have hopefully three new subs next week. Um, and we are uh, planning, you know, to have a robo score of subs in the near future. Uh, we, are planning, sorry, we are planning a town hall in the near future for the subs candidates. So we tell them a little bit about how's the job, what are the steps to apply and what to expect. Hi, Talita. Uh, I have a question about the subs. The email that went out, I had a number of people uh, say that they were thinking about being a sub, but from the email or the the communication, it appeared that you had to have a teacher's license. Is that the case? Well, they can have a substitute license. Some of them have, uh, but Theron has been working on it. Do you want to say something about it? Yeah. Yeah. So. They have a level one and a level two. The level one subs don't re require uh, a, a license or even a degree. There's, so there's an option for, for, for anybody to have access to it at the degree. If you want to have a three-year license through CDE, you would have to meet those requirements, Katie. But otherwise, it would be fair. So just to let you know, a couple of things that we're thinking about doing, because, I mean, Talita has done a great job. We, we already have five that have expressed an interest. So we've added a few there, but I think we want to do a little bit broader uh, casting of the net. And uh, we're going to send out the, the email again, and you know we'll make that clarification if, if, if we're missing it. And I think more importantly, we're going to have a town hall. I think we need to probably just have a quick 30 minute you know meeting with anybody that's interested and get them in there so they can answer those questions and we can get them on board. And if they get fingerprinted and they do that work, we can get as many in, into that cadre as we need. And it would be perfectly legitimate to have them if they didn't have a license. Can, can we put that as an advertisement in the newspapers as well? So we're yes, not an advertisement. Uh, we advertise it for bus driver, um, substitute teacher every other day on Aspen Times for like the past month. No, I mean the town hall. Oh, like okay. town hall. Yeah, yep, you got yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. It was, it was uh, even when I read that, it made it sound like you needed a license that was a teachings license, oh, not gotcha. a special thing. So we, I just want to make sure we make it really clear because a couple of people got scared away. Great feedback, great feedback. And I'm hoping that we, we can get as many in that cadre as possible. Yeah, substitutes remain a challenge. They were a challenge pre-COVID. They're even more of a challenge at this point in time. But uh, Theron and Toledo have been doing some good work, and we do appreciate the clarification on that. Good enough. It looks like Mr. Durham has joined us. Chris, how are things come going in Techland? Oh, uh, you know what? It's minute by minute, David. I'll tell you. But uh, no, we're we're doing well. We've uh, last night we had the second of, uh, of three of the back to school nights with the middle school, um, cast a, a pretty broad net out there um, for support, some heads ups uh, for, for parents and things to look for. Um, had some good conver conversations subsequently, been able to help a few folks out. Same thing with the high school um, uh, back to school night, uh, I believe last week, time's flying, but um, we're, uh, we're still in firefighting mode, um, you know, just all the beginning of the year, um, remote beginning of the year, bumps and bruises um, with um, helping kiddos and families out remotely. Um, my biggest pain point at the present moment are, continues to be the choke supply lines. Still waiting for our 450 new Chromebooks to come in uh, that were ordered back in June. Um, same thing with 160 iPads for the elementary and, and preschool levels. So we're, we're making things work with what we have. Um, but once we start getting this new equipment in, it'll alleviate things uh, considerably. So um, as well as just trying to onboard 
new systems, uh, still working to get Remind up and running and get that all rostered properly so all the kiddos are in the correct teacher classes and begin doing professional development on that. But had two successful professional development days with staff, rolled out all the recordings today as a result of all of those recorded virtual PDs. Um, but I think they, they were all well received. Uh, we had in, internal teachers, tech staff, we had vendors presenting. So we had a pretty wide variety of, of opportunities for folks. And again, all being recorded and um, sent out to everybody today to, to go back and follow up on sessions that they may have missed. Thank you, Chris. It remains a challenge and, and supply lines are tight everywhere. So how about if we hear from the schools quickly? Uh, I know um, Emily Anderson is on here and she has certainly had an exciting couple of weeks. Emily, if you'd like to say a couple words. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'll just kind of give some brief details about what the beginning of the year looked like for us. The 19th, we opened for all of our staff families. And then on the 26th, we welcomed all the community families back. On the 27th, late in the afternoon, we did get our first confirmed case of COVID. Um, and then we were just in constant communication with district administration, public health, and the health office, all problem solving that. We were closed that following week. Um, we reopened September 8th in alignment with the elementary school. And I think that worked out really well. And, you know, we've been back again this week and so far, Everything's going well. Just back at it again. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. We we appreciate all that, all of your work during that um, hectic time. I think Dave's back on now. As, as Chris Durham was saying, technology is a mixed blessing. Uh, Chris Bastin had a couple of good days. Talk to us about the elementary school, Chris. Yes, happy to. Hi, everybody. Glad to share with you an update from the elementary school. It's been a busy and gratifying couple of weeks. Back on August 27th and 28th, we basically moved almost the entire school, spreading our uh, kindergarten through second grades across the elementary school, our third grade occupying a wing at the middle school, and our fourth grade is uh, occupying five classes in the high school. This gave us the ability to, to spread out and to social distance. Um, the week of August 31st, we did our first ever student orientation week where we had a significant number of students and families back on campus for the first time since March to meet with their teachers. As many of you recall, one of my major concerns heading into this school year was not being able to establish those crucial relationships that teachers and kids need to have and rely on for an entire school year. So we basically had about 20% of our students uh, on campus each day and there was uh, just a huge shift in energy that week with lots of happy students, families, and teachers. It was really fun. It was so great to see everybody and everybody was super smart on how they wanted to conduct their meetings. And uh, the kids got to see their new uh, workspaces and uh, went extraordinarily well. On Tuesday, we opened up for in-person learning and I'm glad we decided to do a flex start that first day because we frankly didn't know how many cars uh, we were going to have. The weather had already turned bleak. And so folks that had, and families that had planned to ride their bikes couldn't do so. But we ended up getting everyone on campus pretty quickly, much quicker, far more quickly than we thought might happen. Um, so, uh, we got everybody. We got everybody in the building. We had a lot of things, a lot of learning happening outside. I saw some science experiments being conducted in the small playground. Um, while we had other teachers teaching under covered areas, some of our world language teachers were doing that, and some really powerful all classroom meetings uh, where it really felt like we were one learning community, which I was really happy to see see that happen. 
Again, the cohorting has allowed us to keep uh, social distancing and self-contained uh, with the appropriate amount of space in the classroom, which just increases everybody's comfort level. Um, I really have to say though, the story of the week was just our amazing teachers uh, connecting with students for in-person learning. It was just such a, such a great thing to see. I found the excitement level to be very high. Uh, and it was so great to see our teachers doing what they love to do best, which is uh, in-person learning with, with their students. Uh, I came away from uh, the last two days with the feeling that this is really a truly a community effort. Um, it included our parents, our teachers, our support staff, everybody really rowing in the same direction uh, to make this work and to get it done safely. Um, you know, one of the other things, which is just kind of another one of the nuanced things of the 2020 school years, we got everybody their lunches and you know we don't have a cafeteria that we can utilize anymore so we have a new process for that but again that went really really smoothly as well and i would describe our parents as jubilant they were so happy in the carpool lines and um just the kids were super positive and happy and uh, i think all of our staff members uh felt uh, a great sense of accomplishment and that they had really participated in something that was pretty special. Thank you, Chris. Chris, hey, Chris, Chris it's Dwayne here. I got a couple of quick questions. Thanks for that overview. First question, um, was the um, attendance by all the teachers that obviously needed to be there, was that successful? Was that 100%? For well, everyone that was supposed to be here was here, Dwayne. Yes. Yeah. So that, that, have, we not, that we had not made accommodations for. It. Yes. Right. Right. I, and I understand that you obviously had to do that in several cases, which kind of is part of my second question. How is it that you're handling? I, I got some feedback from a parent, so I just wanted to hear it from you. How is it that you're handling the students, the students who have to opt out of attending in class for perhaps reasons there at the household and uh, pre-existing conditions perhaps within the family so they cannot actively participate in class so they're they're online how is that organized and executed there at the elementary school yes we we've got um one of our teachers who is um running a multi-age cohort uh, of, of students and she needs to be at home for her own um reasons uh we arrived on a a supporting online platform that has lessons and videos that can accentuate and uh, enrich the instruction that is basically being, because we have such few kids, we only have 10 students right now, that that can be very personalized instruction. So I'm really happy about that piece. There's only 10 kids in that particular model right now? That's correct. I, I heard from a parent that we're in some cases, perhaps some of that curriculum that's being offered is is being expensed, charged into the family. Is that accurate or is that just bunk? Bunk. Thank you. Yeah. Have you, have you heard that critique from, from another family or member? Because it was just, I was surprised that that description was being levied out there. I, I had not heard it, Dwayne. Okay. Right. But yeah, it's all... It, was uh, a bizarre kind of, you know, okay, thank you. You're good, welcome. Good, good feedback. <laughs> um, yeah. I have a question or two, Chris. Um, how many teachers have accommodations and aren't working in the building but are working from home? I want to say four. Four, okay. And um, But I from, need, need to double check that, Katie, because I'm just okay. going to the top of my head right now. I was looking more for an order of magnitude, too. Mm-hmm you know, four or five, it's fine. Yeah. Um, and then um, from your, it sounds like you had a very tight, there was a lot of time in your schedule in the morning for getting everybody into school and into their classroom. Since that went so well, um, are you able to adjust the schedule to tighten it up so they have more instructional time during the day? Yes, um, we are. It, 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 thank you for asking that. We're gonna be sending some communication home tomorrow regarding that, because we wanted to see if both cohorts could get on campus quickly and efficiently. 
But we, we had everybody here by 810 today. So I think we're going to be going back to our traditional start time. OK, great. So how much more instructional time do, do you think that gives you per day that each student is there? It could be as much as an hour. Wow. OK. And does that also apply to the end of day schedule? Seem to have a lot of extra flux time in it, too, as well, in terms of the day ending early and that type of thing. Will that also apply or how did that go? I, I think so. I think when we we get a few more days under our belt with getting kids on these uh, new bus on these new bus routes and getting them safely and quickly onto the buses and um, also getting our carpool line moving efficiently, I think there's going to be an opportunity to expand that way as well. Okay. Um, just one, one suggestion on behalf of the, the parents is clearly if we change the pickup time for those that are opting out of the bus system, um, that needs to be articulated well in advance since the, you know, so many of them are working parents that are trying to make accommodations to pick their kids up early. Yeah. Um, so not like the day before, <laughs> but I get it. Thank time. you. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And then I guess just one last question, Chris, where, where are you on the plan? And I know there's a committee working for it. I'm going to ask every school this as well as the overall, where are you on the plan for, um, bringing all the kids back full time? Yeah. I think about it every day. I, I talk to the superintendent about it frequently and about <clears throat> as soon as we would be able to get uh, the go ahead from a safety standpoint, um, we would be able, Katie, to move pretty quickly and efficiently uh, to, to do that. Could you have a plan in place then that's written down that we can review or um, is that just a where does that stand in terms of yeah. having a, a written plan for that? I, I don't have a written plan for it. Um, in fact, I'm not entirely sure um, what spaces would be utilized. I've had some other discussions about, obviously, if the when the high school and middle school students come back, we need to return to this space or, or uh, an alternative space um, if it was deemed to be um, better for teaching so there's still there's still some moving pieces about going around but uh yeah we, we can move pretty quickly okay thank you you're welcome okay thank you chris um going from elementary to middle school liz you're up good evening i'm secretly jealous of chris for having all this in-person time with kids. Um, we're three weeks in and um, we found, I think every flaw that Google Meet can possibly throw at us. Um, we're encouraging teachers to use Zoom when they have the need to use breakout groups with kids. So we're learning that each of those kinds of meetings have specific um, kind of niches um, and, and it's been, I think a good learning process. We had our back to school night last night, we used Zoom. Um, our initial meeting had about 250 people on it. And I thought, I didn't know how many we, we were gonna be able to accommodate, but that was, that was exciting for me. I kept, I felt my heart rate going up every time more people would join that meeting. Um, lots of kudos to the tech team. They have just been incredibly supportive. They host uh, informal lunch meetings for teachers who need to have uh, sort of an info session or to learn about a specific technology. They've just been incredibly supportive. Um, one thing that's kind of exciting that comes from Dave and Theron is that we've created a cadre of coaches amongst our teachers that are gonna start doing a training through the Public Education and Business Coalition. And those teachers will be um, working with the teachers in our buildings um, as coaches in, in their pedagogy and, and content. And that's a program that's been very strong at the high school and at the middle school, it's been 
um, embraced by the math teachers, but now we're branching out into social studies, um, science and language arts. Today we had a supply handout and so parents dropped in and were able to get art, science and math supplies. And our counselors have been hosting new student welcome walks in the afternoons where they get new students together and walk up. I think they're walking up Ajax or Buttermilk and just getting to know kids. So um, trying to balance that need for connection and community in spite of the fact that we are in this very unnatural remote learning environment. And I think uh, Adric kind of highlighted, uh, Adric and Talita, our lack of uh, special ed teacher, reading interventionist, and math specialist. So those are our um, big kind of hiring holes that we hope we're going to be able to fill. What questions do you have? Hi, Liz. How are you doing? Um, hey. So back to school night last night was uh, definitely a success on the Zoom. Um, I heard from a number of eighth grade parents that there was a very large snafu, which the eighth grade team acknowledged, but basically they held a Google meet that you could only get onto on a parent night if you had a K-12 email. And so, you know, I'm sure a lot of parents scheduled move their schedules around to make sure they could be a part of that back to school night. Now the teachers acknowledge it and everything, but I, I kind of want to ask if, what can we do to help? Cause it seems like this many months in that that kind of a mistake when all the other grades did the zoom meeting. So they didn't have that problem. How can we help you guys um, better, uh, coordinate so that we don't have these individual grade level issues. Uh, you know, it was very frustrating for parents trying to get in um, to a, a meeting that was delayed by two weeks too. Um, now they'll be able to listen to it, but it's not the same as a, you know, move around your schedule to make sure you attend it. Is there, you know, what, what can we do to do this better? How can we help? I think that's that's the million dollar question. Um, and it's just, I don't think it's fair to say that it's been months that our teachers have been back for a few weeks and they're really trying their best to deliver um, these large group meetings and, and classes as well. Um, but you know, we live and learn and that's kind of where we are right now with technology. It's we're learning, I think, that you have to troubleshoot in advance. And I noticed that a lot of teams rehearsed their meetings, they did every kind of troubleshooting they could do to make sure that parents were going to be able to access. And the eighth grade missed, they missed a beat there. They were they were trying to do a live stream. Um and didn't realize that their URL was only available to somebody that had a K-12, Aspen K-12 address. So it was a miss. Yeah, it's a pretty big, I mean, I, I, would, I would hope that in the future we would have more coordination between grade levels and not consistently try to reinvent the wheel on everything, um, but to try to find a way to, to better work together to make these things, you know, effective. Cause, um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a bit, it's a big miss on parent night to not have parents be able to listen in. So, you okay. know, let us know what we can do as a board. That's what we're, we're here to support Dave and the rest of the team to, make sure that this stuff is coordinated. Um, and, you know, it really doesn't set a good feel for the parents when, the, I mean, it's one thing to have issues as we go on about kids getting kicked out of classrooms here and there and getting back on and stuff, but to kind of to miss it for the entire parent group is a, it's a big miss. 
Can't that be redone, Liz? Shouldn't that be redone? Sorry, what do you mean by redone? Run it again. Bring, bring the parents of the eighth grade back again if they need to be brought back again. I mean, why, why can't we get that done? Just Well, you know, it was... The meeting was um, recorded and sent out to all parents this morning. And in our Zoom meeting, um, we... I mean, the recordation, I mean, the whole point of parent night, if it's if it's just to be a broadcast, then we don't ever need to bring parents into the schoolhouse on normal world. I mean, the whole point of the of parent night is to have a little bit of dialogue and a little bit of Q&A and just some connection. I mean, I... I'm surprised you guys would not say, well, heck, you know what? We struck out on that one. Let's just let's get back to the plate and swing again in the next couple of days and, and just coordinate at the eighth grade level. I don't even know, you know, it's awkward for me to even be talking about this. It's like, what? Why wouldn't we be doing that as a matter of course? Uh, hello? Everyone? Dave? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I'm hello? I'm 100% with you, Dwayne. I have a couple of other questions. I mean, I think it's it's crazy that it's a stream, that there's not interaction. There was an ability to send emails that would get answered later. That's not, it's not a lecture. It's a parent night. Parents have lots of questions this year. And so then instead of asking, you know, the teachers during parent night, board members are getting phone calls about what's going on. And, and, and you don't want that to happen. Um, so the next question that I've gotten from a number of parents as well is a lot of confusion about the middle school schedule on Wednesdays, which um, since I have an eighth grader, I've spent some time with it. And basically you have a schedule where world languages and explorations have on Wednesday a um, 35 minute class time or 20, 25, 35 minute class time um, the entire school at the same time, meaning fifth grade and sixth grade and seventh grade and eighth grade all have their world language class at the same time on Wednesdays. And we have what, three or four world language teachers. So my understanding is that kids get an email in the morning as to whether or not they will be participating in that class that day. So when we were looking at approving the schedule and looking at instructional time, that Wednesday class, in my mind at least, was presented as this is a class that everyone goes to every Wednesday, and I'm trying to figure out how we're getting enough instructional time for these kids when you have 500 kids in a class with three teachers, or they don't attend. They attend every fourth week, I suppose. I don't, I don't know how it's done. So my question is, is two part, which is how is this working? And secondly, how do we have enough time in the classroom when we're missing a, you know, that whole day for those two topics? The other ones I assume are working out okay because they're period-based, but these two are topic-based. So the Wednesday schedule, the idea behind that is that there are times for teachers to work with small groups of students or to assign reading or other work to students who are not in the seminars and we kind of working backwards we have um our red day and black days are on monday tuesday and thursday friday and wednesday is a day for teachers to check in with students that are needing extra help or to teach a small group lesson some of some teachers are working with large groups of students. So it was really the idea was really that different content areas have different needs for that day and that teachers can create that in the way that best serves their students. Well, then if that's the case, what are office hours for? Because I thought there's an hour of office hours every day also. Isn't that what office hours were supposed to be for? I'm I'm confused about this because it seems like the same thing. Yeah, it is it is a little bit confusing. Office hours are more for one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, but the Wednesday is for small group instruction. And when you're working with students on you know this this platform and you have 25, 30, 40 kids 
in each of your classes, it's important to be able to break out into small groups for kids who need either specialized instruction or enrichment. So that's so, an opportunity. And in addition, on Wednesdays, our specialists and interventionists are working with students, whether it's around language, gifted and talented students, um, or students that need intervention. So, well, so the, the problem I see with the way this is, is the world language teachers, as far as I can tell, don't have any teaching from, unless they're part of this community in the morning, you know, at all until noon on Wednesday. So they don't have any responsibilities for any instruction until noon. And yeah, they have some planning time. So that's important because their class loads are huge. They're not able, we don't have the classes broken out throughout the entire day. So they definitely have some planning time. They have early release Wednesday from one to 345 for planning time. That's four hours of, they've, they've Actually, six hours of planning time on Wednesday. Like, I just don't understand how that's a full time. I'm very concerned and confused about how that's effective. So I would love to readdress this in the future. I just, I'm getting questions. People don't understand the Wednesdays. It hasn't been articulated well. Um, and they're very concerned about why they hear in the morning, whether their kid is showing up for class in the afternoon. Um, and that wasn't, you know, it's a big concern. Um, as, a, as a parent managing someone at home, they have a schedule and they expect their kid to be in class during that schedule. And then when the schedule only applies some days and the parent doesn't get the email, the parent has no idea, how are they, how are we expecting our parents to manage this? I think it's a lot to ask. Think um, of Wednesday as there's asynchronous learning going on and the early release time is professional development. So we, we do build in planning time for teachers. We build in time for teachers to work with small groups of students. These are the kinds of things that during a regular school day, we have um, lunch time for teachers to work with kids. So it, it's, it might look a little, um, kind of, I don't know, funky from the outside, but it's really important for teachers to have time to work with kids and because Synchronous learning is so, it's very intense for our teachers and they, and it's intense for kids too. And we purposely built in time for kids to do some reading, to do some homework, um, to do some extra assignments. And that's what Wednesday is for. So I, I hear what you're saying and I can tell you the feedback that I've gotten is there's way too much of that time, at least from the parent perspective that I've heard from lots of multiple, multiple parents. You know, the hours are shortened during the day already. So what I would love to see, I guess, is the, the feedback that I would love is a comparison of the instructional hours for the teachers now versus pre-COVID. How much time do they have to plan now versus pre-COVID? And if there's a reason for a difference, great. But if you could map that out, I would love to see that if that's something other people would love to see as well. Um, and, and I think it needs to be explained to the parents better because they're, they're not super happy from the ones that are talking to me. That's great feedback. Thank you so much. It's really good. Anything else? That's it for me. Thank you. Okay, um, Sarah, you're up. Talk to us about the high school and all those wonderful things going on over there. Um, <laughs> well, let's see. Um, I think, you know, we're really in a second, you know, kind of full week here, and I think it's going well. Um, I just did a parent feedback loop. I sent it out on uh Yesterday, I have about 70 responses giving us really good feedback. Um, we're doing really well with communication. Um, I think 90% of the parents said they thought our communication was effective. Um, and then in terms of students being engaged and online, um, we had about 80% of parents agree that that's true. 
and meeting student social emotional needs, that was more like 60% just because the comments were about, we can't really meet their needs in a digital world. And then asking about the effectiveness of online instruction, um, a little bit over 50% said awesome about, and then about 25, well, let me look actually, let me see if it's changed. <laughs> um, let's see, they said, so 42% said, yes, I'm very happy with the quality. 40% said, I'm somewhat happy with the quality. And 16% said, no, I'm not happy with the quality of remote learning so far. Um, and then we asked them what's working and what's not. And we also asked them to give specific feedback if they answered no or somewhat to any of those questions. So right now we're looking at tweaking our schedule. Um, we only have five minutes between those big blocks. And a lot of parents said we need long, the kids need maybe more like 15 minutes between blocks. Um, the parents are split 50-50 about the two hour chunk in the middle of the day. I think the idea was that that would be individual conferences with teachers and then time for them to actually do homework away from the screen. But, but for some kids, ooh, I don't know if you guys are getting that, but for some kids, they're not being able to use that time really, really well. Um, so we're, um, I just had a leadership team meeting, so we're gonna kind of look at how we can um, tweak the schedule. Um, we also don't have the early release Wednesday, but it's an easy fix to align with both the middle school and the elementary school to ensure we can do some of that district-wide PD. Um, Liz alluded to the PEBC and the coaching model. Um, and then, you know, we've been looking at a, at a book that, that Dave's really been um, thinking about with the distance learning playbook. Um, I have five teachers in a coaching and mentoring cadre with uh, PEBC so that we can really build some instructional leadership. Um, right now, our big issue, I'm not one for, not a huge one for mandates, but I'm about to make the mandate that we move to Zoom. Um, it's far more effective instructionally. I've been saying that from the get-go with the breakout rooms, the annotation feature. Um, we just need to get all of our kids authenticated so that we can, um, for the safety features. Um, and hopefully Chris Durham has been great. He just sent us a spreadsheet about which students have not authenticated their accounts um, so that as of tomorrow, we can set the settings, which means nobody gets into a Zoom classroom without a K-12 account and their actual username. We're having a little bit of a problem with poor behavior, um, mostly underclassmen, um, ninth and 10th graders using um, really inappropriate racial slurs. Um, so I'm a little riled up about that right now. Um, let's see, what else? We have all of our students right now, nine through 12, taking the STAR assessment in both reading and math. Um, and actually it's a little bit surprising, the data so far. So we'll have to see how that shakes out. Um, and then next week during our crew time, we will be giving the social emotional assessment. And this is the assessment that will identify students in six risk, risk factor areas. And then the key is once those are identified, we'll actually have the tools to have provide appropriate interventions to ensure their academic success. And it's all built around resiliency. Um, I'm not sure what else. I think our back to school night, um, it went well. I think we learned some things. We're going to continue that model for if we're still remote for parent teacher conferences. Um, that parents did really like having a visual of a teacher and being able to click on that teacher's face and, and go right to that teacher. Um, a couple of things that we could have improved upon, which was we, we set up that they could come have office hours with me or with Becky or with tech, but really I just stayed in the main meeting for, for parents who came late. Um, so we could tweak a couple of things to make that more effective. Um, from the student side of it, I'm meeting with the head boy and he head girl every week. Um, Dwayne, you might know one of them, and uh, they've got some really great ideas, so they're going to be hard at work about homecoming, aka homestaying, to get kids celebrating. We're going to try and see. I'll have to meet with the city and see if they can't do a senior parade and celebrate some of that, so we'll just have to think about logistics. We're talking about doing a um, scavenger hunt that would be digital, some geocaching. Um, they had some other really great ideas to build community. Um, I think I'm getting great feedback that teachers are holding the standard really high. Um, there is some concern that, that it's hard to kind of manage the workload, even though they're only doing four classes a day. Um, but people are really concerned about the social emotional and the fact that 
they want kids in the building and having kids get connected. So definitely hearing that message loud and clear. I think that's about it. There's, I'm sure there's lots and lots more, but. <laughs> Oh, we do have our, our ESS students back in the building, um, and that's been terrific. They've been great. It's been so fun to have them there. And um, I should give a big hats off to Chris and, and his fourth grade teachers. It's really fun to have the fourth graders in the high school. And you can see them. They kind of puff their chests up a little bit because they're in the high school now. So. <laughs> hey, thanks, Sarah. Um, uh, maybe one request would be if maybe if your team might be able to chat with the middle school team about the parent night. It sounds like a very different model, um, and it some, sounds like there's some cross learning that could be done um, to, to help make everyone better. Um, I think that would be appropriate. I I think the, the elementary school model might be a little different because they have you know one primary touch point most of the day except for explorations. But you guys both have the not as many in the middle school, but multiple touch points, um, depending on the grade. So I think it would be great if you guys could help each other out. Um, the second thing is just one concern that I heard from a couple parents, um, and it's really more of a, a question, which is given the, the lower number of instructional hours per class, is the expectation that, you know, algebra two, is still algebra two and you, your chemistry is coming, you'll get through the, the whole curriculum this year, even though we're doing it online, even though we're doing it with less instruction. Is, should that be the expectation or, or not? Yes, yes, 100%. Um, and actually I was thinking about that and I'd added up the hours. So we're about, a, we're about 60 minutes short this with this model compared to last year. So an hour of instruction, total minutes wise. Um, I think we forget that in a live classroom, um, we count all those minutes, but when you consider warm up and getting kids into class and the kids going out on bathroom breaks in the end, I, I think it ends up being, not, I don't wanna say a wash, but I will say that today from my leadership team, both Sherry Smith, Serena Sieber, and Charlie Lobby were commenting on how fast they're going through the curriculum. And so for Serena and Sherry, that's IB. Um, because they're like, I'm able to do a mini lesson. Um, I'm able to put kids in breakout rooms and then I'm able to meet with them one-on-one -on -one and be, and just go bam, bam, bam. And then, you know, they have a solid amount of homework. So from my staff, I'm getting the idea that they feel pretty confident that, yeah, they'll be on track. Okay. Good news. Yeah. And um, there's that two hour block too, which again, we're going to tweak, but a, a lot of teachers are using that time, the individual meeting. Kids are really um, appreciating having a way to get in touch with teachers who need the extra support. So um, we'll, it's to be determined, but that's where they are right now. Um, so one question I forgot to ask Liz that I promised I was going to ask everyone is how are we, how is the in-person plan coming? Um, it's great. Actually, Liz, Jason, um, Becky, and myself met today. I can. And I had, we had at the high school created what we would look like an in-person hybrid. Um, so it would follow, I'll put it in the chat for you. Um, and it's, it's gonna need some tweaking. Um, but the idea here, um, there were a couple considerations. And so we need to, one would be, you know, um, is, are, are, is the elementary school able to get back to the elementary school? That would be the first thing, obviously, just because we do need all the rooms. Um, the second consideration that we need to, to talk about is buses. When I spoke with Reagan, you know, she was talking about the fact that we'd need to spread that out. So we looked at planning for a 9 a.m. start. She thought that would give her a turnaround to get elementary in and then get those, those secondary students here by nine. When Liz, Jason, and I met, we can tweak our schedules to match up hour wise start to finish pretty easily so i think that'll be an easy tweak about start to finish um obviously we shorten the time in the middle of the day um i think we're we're looking at cohorts i think one of the challenges we're going to have now if we did a cohort to start um the only way i can get my head around it at the high school is alpha um, simply because kids are doing so many different things um so i think where we landed is that uh, Liz and I would try and do alpha cohorts, and then we'd have to look at um, how the elementary school, because they didn't do alpha cohorts, and see if there were any families that kind of fall in different cohorts and maybe do some hand 
sorting, if that makes sense, just because I think that'd be a burden on families. Um, we'd initially talked about doing a week on, week off, because our teachers are going to have so many students coming through their room. So cohort A would be in person. Cohort B is on a Zoom participating that way. The teachers were actually excited about that because they said what we can do then is instead of having small groups in the classroom, you'd have two students in the classroom join an individual Zoom with two students at home. So it would still be interactive. Um, we're going to need to look at our schedules, though, for parents um, if we all need to be doing, you know, a cohort on Monday, Tuesday, and then there's Wednesday and then a cohort Thursday, Friday. The One of the questions that comes up, do we have the cleaning staff that's going to be able to come in and disinfect all rooms and all buildings on a Wednesday? Um, and and does it matter if the if the high school goes week on week, week to week cohort if everybody's doing two day cohorts, if that makes sense? So we're talking we're asking those questions. Um, I think at the high school, the other problem is we don't have a dedicated space for every teacher. So we have teachers that share classrooms. So we're going to have an issue there about what kind of cleaning, um, what can we do to disinfect and make sure that people are feeling safe-ish <laughs> uh, just because people don't have, we don't have enough space. And um, yeah. And if somebody has a better idea about cohorts besides the, the alpha, I, I've had people much smarter than I and my staff looking into it. And I don't, I can't figure out an equitable way to do it. Um, that would be clean where everybody is, is getting through their, their seven classes plus crew. So it's kind of where we are with that. And we also talked about, sorry, moving the Monday right now. We, we started our Monday to be the kind of remote day where they're doing, you know, the, the setting up for the week, but we can easily flip our Monday to Wednesday if we need to match the middle school and elementary school. And again, that's, you know, for siblings and transportation, not ideal just because I think, um, we also think it could work on Monday if the cleaning crew needed longer time to clean over the weekend. They'd have time to get all the rooms cleaned at the high school. Then they'd have Wednesday at the other schools. So, sorry, a lot of information, but that's what oh, we talked about. Thank you, Sarah. It sounds like you guys are considering a lot. That's great. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> yeah, anytime you move a piece in the puzzle, it has massive implications across across the organization. So, um, you know, we appreciate the high school taking the lead on much of the thinking around this. And, you know, as we form the task force, reform the task force, um, you know, we're going to be sharing that plan and, you know, kind of building off of, of, off of that work. And by design, we're, we're creating it from the you know, buildings coming up so that we can support and eliminate roadblocks. Um, yeah, maybe just one. Um, I know it's just different, Sarah, and at least in the when you're dealing with adults and what we've been seeing in, around surface transmission, it's not at least we're not seeing it that at that high of a risk. And so, you know, in the beginning, everybody was wiping everything down. Um, you know, and there was uh, people spraying stuff every every other second. Um, what it seemed to trend, at least in what I've been seeing, is much more towards just having a lot of hand sanitizer available. And then, you know, obviously people are still wiping stuff down, but they, there seems to be a lot less, um, at least apprehension as time has moved on about people really getting it um, from surface transmission and the quote unquote cleaning. Definitely still the primary risk seems to be, at least in what I've been experiencing, is the, you know, being in enclosed spaces with the extended periods of time for people who are who have it. So the other big thing there is the is the temperature checking. So that would just just a recommendation there on that one when you're thinking yeah. about how you get all the cleaning crews through and stuff like that. And I think that came uh, I think that came a lot from and I totally agree. I'm not I, I don't. I think we've debunked a lot of the surface transmission, um, but I do think there, there are people that are just concerned about the, the number of students that would be moving through a room at the high school. Um, you know, it's different at the, you know, at the elementary school level, you have the smaller cohorts, but you know, I think they're just, it was a, an, an added layer of protection, but I agree. I don't think that's gonna be the, um, the linchpin of, of everybody's safety. So, but a really good point. Thanks, Jonathan. Oh. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, that's pretty much the admin update.
um, I can dive into the superintendent's update, uh, if that's okay. That would be great. <clears throat> great. Um, I will say it has been great having students back on campus. I've gotten to know some of the uh, folks over at the high school. Uh, it's been great seeing the elementary school. And to Chris's point, it does change the energy um, on campus. It's been a long, long time to get kids back onto onto our campus and and you know whether you're on a campus in Pennsylvania or a campus in Aspen without teachers and without kids it's just it's just not right so it's been great seeing teachers and getting to meet teachers it's been great meeting some of the kids um, and we're very excited that a number of the metrics that we've been watching are, are trending in the overall direction that we were hoping they would we are reconvening our, our planning task force on Tuesday the 15th. Um, schedules are under consideration as we've talked about tonight. Uh, the county corona meter had really moved in the right direction for a few days, but has since kind of bumped back up into yellow. So um, while we were in the comfortable or protect our neighbor, which was really exciting, we have bumped up a little bit. Uh, I did ask our contact tracer why, and he said it could be for any one of a number of different reasons. And, and so I don't have a good answer as to why it has bumped up. I assume it has something to do with Labor Day. Uh, and I'm hoping that it will continue to bump down in the right direction. Regardless, we are beginning preparations for bringing more students back to campus. Um, we are going to plan for that, as we've discussed with um, our, our task force and um, other stakeholders. Uh, we're gonna continue to monitor the stake, uh, the, the COVID meter. Um, I do wanna take a moment and remind our families that uh, please, please do not send children to school with COVID-like symptoms. And for staff members as well, we are really encouraging you to stay home, and to take the precautions that we've been talking about. This is not the time. Uh, there is a tradition in, in schools to, you know, come to work sick and power through. This is not the time to do that. Uh, we will work with you on that. So, uh, but anyway, please keep your children home if there are COVID-like symptoms. It's imperative that we continue to work together. It's our best chance of opening more fully and then staying open once we get to open. Um, you know, we know we're asking a lot, um, but this is a tough year. Our best chances for success is to work together. Um, we are continuing to address some of the long-term systemic issues. I have to thank Mr. Jorge Calderon, who is not on here tonight, for all the work he has been doing on the facilities side of the house. Uh, <clears throat> also, I have to thank Elise Dreher, our school nurse, and now COVID liaison for her phenomenal work and working closely with Jorge. Um, we've been implementing new training. Uh, we're working hard to get um, you know, 21st century cleaning supplies on hand. Things have been allowed to languish, uh, but the teams are responding well and we're working hard to both document and to uh, uh, improve our, our facility side of the house. Uh, Mrs. Linda Warho will be addressing air quality at Aspen Elementary School and across the district in her report. Uh, and we do have some good news there that we can talk about there. Um, you have heard our administrative update. And I just have to say I'm incredibly appreciative of all the work that the team has been doing. Uh, we've been going probably 60 miles an hour since July 1st. And, you, you know, um, there are some glitches. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we are trying to build this airplane as it flies, and, and it's starting to really take a good shape. I do want to remind everyone that the initial plans for opening were just that, initial plans for opening and subject to revision as the corona meter improves, as we refine and analyze you know, contact hours and content delivery. So we will continue to tighten things up. Uh, instruction remains the highest priority after safety for this administration. And I can't thank the team enough 
for the countless hours outside, you know, the traditional eight hour workday. So I know many of them are burning uh, the candle at both ends and I'm incredibly appreciative of all the work. You know, when I call Emily Anderson at eight o'clock on a Friday night, she picks right up. <laughs> Elise Strayer chimes right in. Theron on a Sunday is like, what's going on? So, you know, and across the boards, that's, it's like that poor Sarah Strasberger. If she gets another text from me late at night, she'll, you know, regret having taken the position. I hope not. But um, anyway, it is an unprecedented year and we're con continuing to address the many challenges of 2020. I, for one, can't wait for this year to end. I do want to say that our curriculum audit is moving ahead full steam. We will be reporting back to this board soon. The results of that probably within a month. Um, and Mr. Mulberry, as one of the superintendents in the district, you have some information to share. So I will hand the ball over to you and then that will conclude the superintendent's update. So, Mr. Mulberry, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Dave. And it sounds like you guys have gotten a, a lot of information. Just a few things to add uh, around this. One of the one of the things that has just been a bulwark of what we've been trying to get accomplished here, in order for the teachers to be able to teach effectively from the classrooms and and also have an option uh, to not have to have competing childcare needs while they were doing is, is our supervised learning program that we've uh, got up and running at the uh, at the district level and using both of the gyms at the high school. And a big thank you to uh, Sarah and to Jorge and all the folks that made that happen for us uh, at that. But I really want to just uh, send out a huge uh, amount of thanks to Meg Dangler uh, and uh, Catherine Sand and the AFC team for making that happen. Uh, it's incredible. They're doing it with subs and they are made, able to meet with uh, lots of staff children uh, to make sure that they're available to teach. So just right off the bat, uh, they put, put that together in such a, a, in a, in a quick and efficient way. And, and we're very happy that we're having success uh, with that program. Um, a couple of other things uh, it had been mentioned uh, previously by a couple of our principals, but very excited about the, um, uh, kicking off our instructional coaching uh, work at all the, the levels of the schools now, instead of, you know, we, we started that work last year at the high school at the recommendation of PABC. And I know that Sarah has been a, an advocate of PABC. How long, Sarah? 12 years now? 12 years, I think, something like that. So just, it's wonderful to see this uh, adopted district-wide. And um, we had 14 teachers participate in, in that training. So I think we're building a cadre of people that uh, uh, can help us out and just making sure that all of our instruction is occurring in a world-class way and will be directed by our teachers. So we're very excited about um, that work. Uh, Another thing, we did have a meeting with STAR. We're doing our best to create a dashboard. I know that you've been very interested in having an idea of, of what's happened with COVID and, and having a, a real articulation of what, what's going on with the COVID slide. We should have some of those details soon in a report uh, from all, all levels. And we had a chance to meet with STAR yesterday. And I just wanna let you know the meeting was prompted by Becky Oliver, uh, who is just a STAR expert. And we really have expanded that as, as being one of our only uh, pieces of information that we can get across the board that's gonna measure the same things. Unfortunately, not having the uh, state testing last year, or fortunately, however you wanna look at it, um, we don't have any real summative data right now to, to share with us. So this uh, baseline data will be nice and we have some historic data that we can compare it to. So we think we can put together a pretty cogent uh, picture of what that looks like. Um, the curriculum audit is, is continuing. We still have some work to, to get done with that, but we are excited to have that come out as a, uh, a year zero, a baseline for us to talk about where we need to go instructionally. And just I know that um, everything else uh, has been eclipsed by our COVID reopening plan, but just know that we are working uh, tirelessly behind the scenes to get that, that other work started and, and, and implemented. And again, it's just a, it's a testament to the nasty of our teachers and, and principals and then willing to keep doing this work in spite of all of the uh, other challenges that we've had with COVID. Um, let me see if there's anything else that I wanted to talk about. Oh, another, can I ask yes. a quick question sure, sure, about, sure. Um, do we have any idea, anybody in on, on this call, on this meeting, does anybody have any recollection of when the last curricular audit has been was done? Any recollection of one? No. Wow. So, I mean, so, so clearly it's timely. I think that <laughs> I think we can all agree that on, on, on that. Yeah, I think so. It's awesome that it's happening. 
That's awesome. Well, and I just think I think that's just going to give us a great conversation starter. When we have the conversation with some of the instructional leaders around this, around the district, uh, including our, our principal group, this we're all excited about having a place where we can all be talking the same language and, and be very clear on where we are. And, you know, uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of things in there that are, are going to be difficult to hear. And there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be very positive to hear. And we're, we're, we're excited to see what work is working and what isn't. And uh, we're going to make the adjustments. Um, subs uh we're trying to we thought we we did an initial look at just just doing some some flyer work and some advertising we think it would be better just to have and i think i talked a little bit about this earlier but we do think it'd be better to have a meeting where we can have a back and forth about it because i don't know if everybody knows exactly what we're asking i think if we just invite everybody to one spot and have a conversation about it we might have a little bit more clarity around it it is a little complicated but the great thing is, is we have the capability to get the background checks and we have so many people in the community that are interested in doing it. And once they find out that they can get that level one uh, cert without without a lot of, uh, of hoops to jump through, I think that uh, they'll be very excited to come on board and help us. And I just want to make sure that we just have those supports. Should there be any uh, issues with uh, uh, any sort of... Uh, outages that we would might have due to COVID uh, with, with our staff that we'd be able to, to, to come in uh, on board with that. And I also talked to uh, some folks that'd be willing to do some real tech training with them so they'd be able to help out with the teachers that are even doing it remotely. So we're very excited about that possibility. We're a little behind the eight ball, but we're hoping to have that up to speed in the next couple of weeks. Theron, um, mm -hmm. how many have expressed interest in substituting? So far, we had five to that, that have actually accepted, uh, but we've had several inquiries, but we're also just afraid that we're just not, because I mean, when I'm out in the community and I'm talking to, to people, they're saying they're interested in doing it, they just haven't submitted anything. I don't think they're going to come in and do an application. I'm going to have to get out there and, and, and get them in to a meeting and just have everything ready to go for them so they can get it done. I just know sometimes, you know, uh, I, you have to go to the mountain to get this stuff done. And that's what we're going to do here, because I just don't think people understand how to navigate it. And, uh, that's where we're going to be. So we'll try that. And uh, hopefully I have a uh, have more than five to report next time we meet. So we'll see uh, where, where, where that goes. I have a couple of questions. Um, and I'll just start out to both of you. <laughs> Sounds like a joint. Um, so the first one is on the supervised learning program. Mm -hmm. um, so is, is it taking place in all three uh, how does it work do the kids all go just to one gym or is it multiple things and how many teachers children are involved in this program so uh right now you have you have the the middle the, the middle school age students are in the skier dome and you have the elementary age students uh in the uh large gym at the high school and what happens is that just like they do with the day camps, Katie, they have to call in the week before if they're going to be interested in doing it the week of. Does that make sense? So that's so the numbers fluctuate depending on what the what the parents need. So, like for example, the cohorts were very small yesterday on the Wednesday. The weather, all those sorts of things, dropped it to around three. So what we had in each each one of them, but we've had it up as as high as eighteen to twenty in each of the in the in each of the pods, and so a total of around. I think that our biggest day is in, is 40 plus. So that's that's where we've been numbers wise with it. But I can get you a more detailed day to day with that from Meg. She's been great about about handling that. Okay. And it's only teachers, kids, or is it also other staff? Staff. 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 Any staff? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so and, I to, can I just I have just a follow up question for that. Um, mm -hmm. So that that supervised learning. It's basically a place where they can do their online online learning, and they have um, some support there just to to help them. It's not they're not it in correct class. correct. They are not getting they are not getting instruction. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, they're okay. getting the instruction is happening just like everybody else is doing. What we have is basically a supervised learning environment, so their parents can be available to teach. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there is there any um, has there been any discussion? I know. Um, Michaela at the youth center has opened up some space for people who's who are working full time and need a place for their kid to go and did this exact same thing. Um, but there aren't that many spots. If we have all these spots available or how many spots do we have available that are not being used? And mm -hmm. can we offer those to other community members that, you know, also have both parents working full time? I mean, the parents have the same issue the teachers do. 
um, except they're probably, they could be going to work and just leaving the kids home alone. So. Right, and Katie, um, I think we need to- get back in class. Right, right, I think we can take a look at that. I know that Catherine Sand and AFC is, this is their, what their, what their primary responsibilities is getting getting this figured out and childcare, obviously, so people can be able to work uh, is, is, a, is a big uh, consideration throughout the Valley uh, right now. So we're, we're gonna work with them to figure out what that happens. And the partnership might look like sharing some spaces and doing some other things like that, but uh, we can talk about perhaps doing some of that. But I think there were some major uh, pitfalls from from having our, our our group mixing with the other groups because we're trying to keep some of the cohorting work uh, up here. And so there's there's a lot of considerations around COVID that we, we we thought about with that. But ultimately, you know, I'm more than willing to to take a look at it to see if we if we what our total number of uh, spaces are with um, Aspen Family Connections and with our supervised learning. So you can, you guys can at least make a, uh, an informed judgment around it. So, I mean, the solution in my mind is kids oh, go back to full time. So, you know, that yeah. was the segue into this, which is, you know, clearly the best solution is we're back in school full time every day, like, you know, normal. And with, you know, the metrics in the community fluctuating a little bit, um, my question that, I, that I've asked, you know, every school, it's a, I did forget the middle school, um, is about the plan. And Dave talked to um, the fact mm -hmm. that the team is getting back together. Um, but I feel the need to um, express a, a deadline for this so that when we do get to the point that we're able to go back, we, it, it's not going to take us a month, um, that we have a plan in place and the plan might be stages might not I, I don't know but the plan needs to have an end game of how do we get to everybody in school full time um so i guess what i wanted to throw out tonight is a uh suggestion that by our next board meeting i mean this committee has been formed for over a month now um by the time we get to our next board meeting it'll be well over a month um, I'd like to throw out a, by the next board meeting, I'd like to see a plan for the full district for going mm -hmm. back in person full time and how we get there and mm -hmm. what exactly needs to happen to get there. And I want that shared with the parents as well, because I think it is, it needs to be a community public document that, that everybody can look at so we can understand where we are. There's a lot of concern about, okay, the COVID meter went to green or blue or whatever color it is on the left. Um, you know, what's going no. on? Why are, you know, what, yeah. nothing happened. You know, <laughs> I thought this was magic. So, mm -hmm. um, I understand it's complicated. I understand every time you change one thing, it gets another, but I think we owe a, a plan. Um, it doesn't mean it's the final, 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 obviously things change as things change and, you know, we need to adjust, but we need to have a plan. And I, I personally, and I, I don't know what the rest of the board feels. I'd like to see it by the next board meeting for the whole district. Yeah, I agree with that. And I would also say that we should, uh, for the task force, ask them to plan for the best. I mean, I think um, if we uh, use the experience that we had in the, in the beginning of all this, once we shut down, you know, after a couple of weeks, everything kind of goes away. You know, people are after Labor Day, usually um, the town really starts to empty out. Um, and basically, you know, in October, there's nobody from here that, that doesn't live in Aspen. So um, that should, you know, just by the sheer drop in volume of people and of people coming in and out of the community, we're going to have a natural control there as long as we don't have a breakout. And so we should plan on, you know, things getting continuously better um, just based on that natural dynamic, I think, and make sure we're anticipating that. So if we have two weeks of green, that means boom, we're opening the following week type of thing um, would be my my hope and expectation of, of something that. And just uh, I do just wanna also say we really appreciate all the hard work you guys have done to get everything up and running to this point. Um, we know it's not perfect and we all wanna get back to the in, in school model, but it, it you know does not go unnoticed that all the hard work that's gone into getting us this far, so. Speaking of, the, speaking of the hard work, um, I got the invite for the uh, next like 100 Tuesdays or something. I'm oh, sorry, maybe six Tuesdays. Um, 
and I can't uh, I, I assume because I was the rep uh, before. I wonder if we can have all the board members look find out if they can alternate and Dwayne go to one or a couple and or Katie go to a couple or Susan or Jonathan. Susie, I can send out like a sign up list that yeah. everyone can fill in. That sounds yeah, I, great. I was planning on being on the Tuesday, September 15th. Uh, meeting i've got to get that slated in there from earlier in this call i i support i agree with uh, what katie you know, is advocating for and I, I suspect everyone sees and, and you know would agree with the logic i mean it's, it's absolutely clear and I'm, I'm sure the task force is uh is of the same mindset i think there's some good momentum there's been some good work good uh good indicators in front of us like the words that we plan for the positive, I like that a lot as well. Let's keep this good momentum moving so that by perhaps you know, by the end of the month, it looks a lot different for us. I'm reminded of the Aspen Community School, um, who obviously had to develop a bit of an alternative uh, you know, attendance regime, but they are in our school district and they are in class. They're finishing their third week in class this week. I realize it's a different campus. But nonetheless, there's there's a lot of, I think, data and evidence there that we can rely upon to kind of give us the confidence to continue to push hard. I agree. Well, I, I think we have uh, some marching orders and we will strive to uh, get a phased plan fully out. Um, we'll try to flesh it out. It'll be an aggressive agenda on Tuesday. Um, and hopefully we can get uh, you know the next steps mapped out in a reasonable time frame. We can make some assumptions. We'll make it clear that we're making assumptions to the community. And if those assumptions come to pass, then we can continue with our plan. And if the assumptions change, we will have to adapt the plan. Um, and, and that has been sort of the guiding principles anyway. Um, and you know, I, I really do think, um you know some of the challenges we face will be uh migrating the fourth grade back uh into the elementary school uh middle school has said that they could manage uh third grade longer in a hybrid model but certainly when they're fully open you know we'll have to have third grade back in third grade over the elementary school unless we can find you know an underutilized campus somewhere in the immediate area um, uh, and so we can go from there so yeah well thank you david there and i appreciate that um you know i, I uh, cynthia chase just posted a note about the number of calls aef is getting about confusion from parents about why we aren't, aren't in school i'm getting similar calls um from lots of parents everybody knows what other districts are open and you know some of them are you know eagle county you know i we their their numbers aren't as good as ours and they're open so um you know there's a lot to work through i understand there's a lot so a lot of fears and concerns and, and everything but if we don't have a plan we certainly can't implement the plan so <laughs> let, let's get there and, and get by and get everyone there and get the kids back in school full time so you know my my biggest concern about all of this is the disequity um, you know, we have teachers' kids who are, who are supervised. We have uh, parents who have the means to, um, you know, put their kids in pods and do all sorts of other things. And the kids who don't have, come from families with, you know, financial support necessary are, can be the losers in this. And, and that's why we really need to, to get them back in school. Um, I just have one last question on your presentation, which was related to the audit and the timing related to getting that math program that we talked about it was it one or two board meetings ago um up and running for the seventh grade in q quarter two and does the timing of the audit finishing and starting those programs and also trying to get the sixth grade start program started does, does that work so the math programming and um you know is running on a separate rail from the audit. Okay. So this is a one-year rollout 
sort of bridge to kind of address some of the issues that the middle school had identified, if I can say that uh, fairly. Um, and so this is a one year bridge um, program. And then the audit will guide a full recommendation for K-12 math and language arts uh, that we hope to have in, you know, sort of January, February that would okay. allow the district to plan for a coherent full preschool. And I want to be very clear that it includes preschool through 12th grade continuum of learning for language arts and mathematics. Right. And so, you know, obviously um, <clears throat> we need to get the audit back before we can even begin planning that COVID planning is sort of superseding this, the math plan and, and Dr. Mater is putting together a communication uh, for the community addressing the math um, situation. We'll review it together and then we're going to make sure that it meets the needs of the community for this year. Okay. In effect, the plan that we talked about a board meeting or two ago is, is a bridge sort of plan. Um, and, you know, I certainly understand that many high performing districts, you don't have to double up on math to get to eighth grade algebra. Um, so part of what we want the audit to help us with is making sure that we have checks and balance to make sure that eighth grade algebra means eighth grade algebra. It means algebra one is what I mean by eighth grade algebra, right? So algebra in the high school, we have to make sure that algebra in eighth grade, they're the same course, right? And pacing guides, curriculum materials, that sort of thing. So that will evolve from the audit. Okay. You could think. But the, the only question that seemed to be remaining was the concept of sixth grade having another zero hour class with them. And and I left with the impression that there was some potential feedback from the audit that might affect whether or not that happened or not. And that's what I was, well, you know. It, interestingly, um, between now and back then, Dr. Mader found that eliminate illuminate, I always have trouble with that word, too many <laughs> vowels, right? Too many vowels. So uh, e e illuminate math has an advanced or a compressed math track within sixth grade. And they're looking at implementing that in sixth grade. So that I assume will be part of her communication okay. that she puts together. And like I said, I'm hoping to have that in the next day or so for review and we'll go from All right, thanks Dave. Yeah. I'm done, somebody else's turn. Well, I, I actually think it's the board's update turn because we have a lot of questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Good. Um, it, is, it is time for um, board member updates. Um, so board members, do you have any um, Thing you need to let us know about so i was um negligent in replying to susan about my specific policy um updates and i have worked very hard on my policy updates i just haven't had a chance the last 72 hours to write them down and get them to everybody um but i would love to share um, at some point, my suggested reviews of our revisions to R1, two, four. We have a whole um, agenda item for this. Okay, so I, because I didn't write it down, I didn't think I'd be allowed to go through it at the agenda time. So I was going to just preview it here. <laughs> no, that's okay. Okay. I'll save it for the agenda item. Okay, great. That's all. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, just a question maybe for Dave. Um, I, I know I've been able to participate in some of the HR thing. Did, how is that going? Did we extend an offer? We, we are making progress. Um, and I will update the board tomorrow as to where we are in okay. that conversation. We, we still have um, kind of a, a, a part of the puzzle that we need to close before we open the rest of it. Uh, but we are in a very good place moving forward. We're very excited. And uh, Talita is helping me uh, wrap up the process 
and we think we're in a very good place with the HR hiring. Anybody else have a, a board update? I have just a couple of um, comments. I, I think, because um, I know in our original plan um, for reopening, that there was some some um, guidance about, you know, if we are at the at a certain point on the corona meter for two weeks, then that's when we can open another um, piece. I think reiterating that to parents, as well as a more detailed plan of what what then will happen after um, we've been in in a good place for two weeks um as soon as we can would really give them some comfort i feel like that we're um moving towards that and i realize the focus has really been on let's get these elementary school kids in there and and i i certainly applaud that but i just i know that that's on on parents minds about you know what what's next so that's one thing. And then I just wanted to give a quick um, little update about uh, the campaign committee, which I'm serving on to um, to <laughs> to um, uh, ensure a successful passage of several ballot measures that are of interest to the school district. The, um, we have a bond um, repurpose that that will not raise taxes, but would we would um, gain some needed capital improvements and staff housing, um, a sales tax renewal in the city of Aspen, and a tax renewal in Snowmass Village. And so we, we had a, a initial campaign committee meeting, and so we're moving forward with that. And anybody who um, would like to participate um, and it, it I think it's kind of fun actually to do the campaign piece, but um, anyone who would like to participate, uh, let me know. And, and this is aside from our roles as school district persons, it's an issue committee that, that's separate from the district, but um, it's moving along and, and it's exciting to get that going. I'd add, I'd add to that, Susan, and remember the uh, the good feedback. I know that we briefly spoke about this uh, at the board, previous board meeting, but the good community feedback from the survey that yep. was produced, uh, not only for the bond renewal, which could obviously generate up to $95 million to fund housing and capital improvements, and then some real dreamy stuff there on the campus, you know, future, future buildings and cleanup of the child care facility, blah, blah, blah. Um, but beyond that, it... it it was a big strong yes, as Susan refers to the sales tax initiative uh, renewal there in the city of Aspen, and also the real estate property tax override that's in place uh, up in Snowmass Village. Both of those had uh, some um, survey indicators that there's strong support for all three, uh, very strong for the two that fund, that fund into the general fund. Yeah. That's great, but we cannot rest on our laurels. We're going to have to get out there and do a lot of infomercials and give away a bunch of you know, blenders and toasters and make sure we get a lot of folks uh, energized so that come, uh, you know, when the ballots hit the the, uh, the houses, right? October 14th, roughly, it hit your mailbox. Yeah. So we got, we got a lot of giddy up. Yeah, we got a lot of giddy up right here, right now, next 30 days of uh, a runway. So thank you, Susan, for that. Katie is pitching too. Way to go, Katie. Love you. Appreciate it. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> um, I also just wanted to, I had some questions about um, the, there was an article in the newspaper about a previous um, bond that, that um, it sounded like we had um, secured money for staff housing, but then we didn't build that staff housing. And I don't think that's accurate. I think um, it wasn't enough staff housing, um, but I think we didn't, we asked for, for the bond money and we built the houses that we asked for the money for. So I don't, I just want to clear that up that, you know, we, we, that was back in 2005, but um, I think that's an important piece that, that we have built what we um, got money for and we would like to build more. 
And if I may, a, a little postscript, uh, Katie often reminds me, and she's right, we've got to obviously kind of stay clear now that we're moving into campaign mode. We, uh, as board members, will be looking at campaign committee of a group of volunteer citizens. And so we'll have to ensure that we abide by, you know, state statute. We won't be advocating or overly promoting. So um, you will not be hearing anything more from me on that point. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> well said. Um, all right. Any other board comments? We can move on to a uh, financial update. Linda? Yes. Hey, I actually turned my microphone on. I didn't have to talk for five <laughs> minutes and figure out I didn't have my microphone on. Um, I just shared a link with you all, but I'm going to discuss that at the very end. But just so if you wanted to click on it and and do it. It's an update for our air quality um, system, the bipolar quote on there. Um, first thing I wanted to let you know that I've scheduled our auditors to come in and they will be in the first week in October. I am um, very excited about that um, because hopefully um, we can get some audited financials on time this year and, and post it to our website. And um, they are going to do their audit remote. So that will be interesting. So wanted to let you know that. And then I have um, a couple upcoming meetings next week that are important to us. And the first one is on, um, actually both of them are Monday next week. We're gonna be meeting with the Aspen Public Education Fund. That's the sales tax um, revenue that is received in and um, I put together an ask for them that just matches totally completely off of our budget so it's the same documentation that's in our budget our adopted budget and um, if they accept that um, they will be asking for a payment of a million dollars um, that will come to us in the next it should be in the next month so, and then we also have on Monday, we have our financial accountability board meeting um, going on. So um, this will be, I think our third time of meeting. So um, that'll be interesting and we'll see what direction that goes on there. And um, next things we have going on are um, CDE. I've, um, we've had some reporting requirements that um, are going on um, and I kind of just wanted to get them on the record and make sure that um, we don't miss these deadlines in future years. But we have something called a CDE 40. That is how we get our reimbursement back for transportation. And um, that I'm going to be submitting tomorrow. And we get about $150,000 from CDE for, to cover transportation costs. And um, then we have our COVID relief fund that we already received the money, the 900,000. And I had to say how much of that money we had spent so far. Um, first, they call it first quarter because it's all fiscal weird, weirdness, but it's last year, last year for us, what we spent. And um, we've, we came in at about $570,000 that we spent of that 900,000 um, so far. And then, um, we have the Tabor notice questionnaire that's going on with our bond election. I have a couple questions in to Dan, but I should have that finalized tomorrow. So we'll definitely meet our due date on that. Um, then school fees, just um, in case, I don't, I think there's so much going on that you, you all won't receive questions on this. Um, people are more concerned with that, but I just wanted to let you know, we're really holding off on charging students any school fees that would typically go out because I just, I want to see, I'd rather collect it late than have somebody pay. And then we have to turn around and reimburse them later. So we're just, we're just holding off on that. Um, but we haven't forgot about them. We're just holding off. And then the employee housing loan program that we have, uh, we're going to be closing hopefully next week on um, the first loan that I have ever done. It's been, I gotta tell you, um, our attorney, Mr. Bump, has been just um, so much help. I can't, I can't, he's just, he's writing it all together and got all the promissory note and stuff. But um, it's, it's pretty nice to finally be able to be seeing that program utilized. Um, and by the way, the interest rate on that program follows the current T-bill rate. 
And so it ends up being 0.44%. So it's fantastic rate. And it's an interest only loan for, you know, the time of it, the five years. So it's a, it's a great program. And I think the more we can get that out, that information out, maybe others could start utilizing that too. Um, and we are forming, now we've got so many changes here. Um, I just came up on my one year anniversary, which I can't even believe that I've been here a year. Um, I need to start, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes when I think of all the stuff that we have going on and what needs to be done, I told um, Dave I was gonna start making a list of all the things I've done so I can look at that and see, oh, these are these are changes we've done to keep keep positive. But we're going, we're working on a new process related to employee housing on how we actually manage that and make sure that proper communication, we've really had a lack of communication um, between facilities and finance and HR. So we're working on a process to hopefully make it better. And so people aren't ever surprised by a move in or a move out or you know the quality of maybe a housing uh, housing property that somebody's coming into. So um, we're working on that and um, excited about that. We've been calling it our employee housing club. <laughs> and it, it's just the internal processes that we we just we're we're gonna make better. Okay, and then finally, this is on the air quality um, quote, and it's on an action item also on 7.3 that you have today. But the action item, the quotes that are attached um, in your board, um, it's broken out by site. And I thought that made it a little confusing um, to see what the total dollar amount of this project would be. So um, that's why I wanted to give you the draft presentation of, um, that was given to us earlier with Dave and myself to, earlier today um, on it. And it, it, you know, when I read through these, um, we, we've talked about this quite a little bit on, you know, what the unit actually does and, you know, what, what we needed to install um, in there. And the, he goes into great detail, you know, in on the different specifics. But I look down at the bottom line and um, on the last page, we originally thought the estimate was going to be around $900,000. And it's coming in quite a bit lower. Um, and one of the reasons is because um, what Dave and I found out today is costs, labor costs in Colorado um, are quite a bit lower um, than what he's seen in other locales and other places that have been looking, other states that have done this system. So that helps. The installation cost is quite a bit lower than what he thought it was going to be. Um, the other thing we did build into this, um, he built into the quote in here is a contingency of $20,000. And I'd like to keep that in here and on the PO just because, um, one, labor costs, they are, are nice, but we're in Aspen and sometimes weather and stuff happens and fires and we can't get people out here and Time is of the essence if you all approve this, that we want to get this rolling as, as soon as possible um, moving forward with this. And um, I think that is what I had. So if anybody has any questions um, related to my quick talk there. I do have one question, um, Linda, related to student counts in October. It just occurred to me that it's going to be a different year, possibly, if we're not all 100% in-person, full-time by, uh, you know, the, the count dates. And I was curious if, A, the state has issued any guidance related to that for the online and learning environment. In particular, I'm concerned about the cohort concept and, you know, not having everybody necessarily checking in every day. Um, so do are we on top of that or are we still waiting for information or where does that stand yeah we're um we're we're moving through it like everyone out every other school district they have issued a few <laughs> little pieces of information on there um and theron has been involved a little bit on this too going forward trying to make sure we're compliant with everything on cde um i'm really concerned to be honest that if on October 1, we're remote learning. 
Um, and then all of a sudden, let's say October 15th, we come back in person learning, um, that we wouldn't get funding for those students that come in and re-enroll on October 15th because they thought we were going to be online on October 1st. So we're gonna have to really watch that and monitor that and plead our case to CDE if that's if that's it, because um, they should never, you know, the, the flavor of the system should never be not to accept a child just because they're coming in on October 15th and you're not going to get funding for them for the year. So um, I think that's a lot of concern with a lot of places. So we're, we're going to have to keep watching that and monitor this water that we're treading in right now. Well, that might need to be a consideration of timing of plans as well. Thank you for that. And then the one other question on the, 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 contract and we want to talk about the i know it's later in the agenda yeah but since we had anticipated and i believe you had said you'd kind of found the money for this were there other issues related i seem to recall there were some other issues related to the hvac that were pretty antiquated and needed to be replaced or enhanced or repaired i don't know what the right word is <laughs> um is that a consideration as part of this or is that completely I know it's completely separate financially, but are we considering doing any of that work as part of it? You know, um, I think at this point, <laughs> we're really waiting to see what happens with the bond election um, before we do any major HVAC repairs. And correct me, Dave, if I'm if I'm wrong on that. But So, yeah, I've, I've been working with Jorge around that. <clears throat> so if you approve this tonight, what this does, and the reason we went down this path, <clears throat> is this basically sanitizes the air as it's flowing through our existing units. At this point in time, all the existing units are moving air. Um, a, at least two of them have cracked heating coils, which means that they're moving air, but they can't heat the air. So, and I believe it's over the, it, it, it's, it's the unit in the auditorium, and I believe it's the unit closest to the entryway at the elementary school. So what will happen is those will blow really cold air. And so we have to keep an eye on that or, or be careful about the use of those spaces. The rest of the units will blow clean, warm air as it now exists. To fix the heating coils, you usually, Again, like Linda said, we're kind of looking at the bond before we dive into that. It could be thirty, forty thousand dollars, and there's uh, economies of scale because probably what we will do with the bond is replace a lot of the HVAC equipment, upgrade it, and and one of the reasons we're going with this particular needlepoint bipolar is that it, while it does attach to our current units, they can be detached and then put into the new units. So it, 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 it's kind of a portable solution. I mean, it's not portable in the sense you can't just pick it up and move it. You got to unscrew it, plug it back in, that sort of thing. So <clears throat> the reason for this is it just really cleans the air and, and it's an active instead of passive system, right? So filtering is kind of a passive system. Um, if we were in a classroom, it's cleansing the air as the kids and teachers are breathing it. And, and so it's also sort of sanitizing it. It changes, it bonds with not just COVID-19, but influenza, smoke. Um, it will make the general air quality lots better moving forward. But in answer to your question, you know, prior administrations didn't fix the heating coils. Um, Partly because it was a big nut to take on, partly because I don't know why. Um, <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I, I don't understand that. Um, most of us who've been doing this understand that an ounce of prevention is worth a dollar downstream. So I, I don't know why. But that's kind of where we are. There's at least two heating coils that are cracked. That's probably around sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 to fix right now probably better to save that for the bond and then just provide alternative heating in those spaces. Okay, so they will still function with those units, which was basically yeah. my question. We don't have to replace that. 
Yeah. Um, and yeah. we'll have to always cut me off when I get too long winded. <laughs> yeah. No, that's okay. Thank you. Hey, Katie, and I did, I wanted to say too, the money that I, you know, found to pay for this was using reserves on cap reserve money. So it, it's always smart to have a little balance, you know, in your cap reserve for those heaters that go out, you know, in, in a wing or something. So I, I don't want anybody. Um, it's funny the the messages I get after this board meeting, I'll get some, some ones about, Oh, you found some money. Can I have some of this? I just want <laughs> to let people know on the record that, yeah, I found some money, but we really would like to keep it aside in, for, for the next problem that we have to, to handle facilities wise. Which might be student counts too. So <laughs> <laughs> Did Thank people you. were people reporting feeling cold around where those two coils are broken? Uh, <laughs> yeah, the reports coming out of the elementary school are, are just get longer and longer. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, they report being cold and wearing coats and jackets in the building. And I, I do think things are changing in the comfort levels with reporting problems is increasing i think that's part of it uh, but also we are working hard to respond in real time to the challenges and and i even though jorge's not on this call i gotta tell you he is a wealth of expertise and information and he's very focused on trying to you know put out 20 20 bonfires at once so um not least of which is the reopening challenges but uh Chris, you can speak to the temperatures in your buildings far better than I can. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's cool. The, 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 the areas that are impacted are the district theater, the cafeteria, which we're not using right now, of course, as well as the library. So it's, I mean, yeah, you, you want to keep your jacket on. But, yeah, we're moving around a lot, and so it, it's workable. And do you know how many years that's been the case that people have had to wear coats? I don't, Susie. I, it seems like the library uh, has been the most recent and, and oh no, the cafeteria was the most recent one to fail and then the library. So um, yeah, we, I, I don't know how long we've been wearing jackets, but. <laughs> well, hopefully we can get that fixed sooner than, rather than later. Shouldn't have to wear jackets at work. Right. Sounds good. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay. Any other um, questions for Linda on her um, report? Let's move on so we can um, get all get to all of our items. Um, we're we're moving to discussion items. Um, we have in front of us our review of what we went through in our board retreat. Um, what I'd like to do is discuss it a bit here. I think that Jonathan had an addition. I have a bit of an addition. Um, and then be able to approve our, um, our priorities and values um, in our action item following this in this session. So um, right now I'll open it up for any comments about this summary of our session. and. Um, we kind of came to a conclusion of some general priorities. I want to make sure that we're all clear about those. And then ultimately, I think we need to add some descriptions and some um, uh, to-do lists and whatnot action items on each of these. But um, anybody have some comments about our uh, priorities? Good. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have uh, Jonathan. Yeah, there were some additional comments that have been posted. Let's hear those so we can keep moving. Those were yeah. on values, so let's let's do the priorities. Yeah, I didn't have anything on priorities. I think those are the right priorities. Good to go. I, I did have as a priority um, some equity, um, uh, just to address equity in our district. I would say and. I think that can be included in academic improvement and and partially culture and climate. So as we get into more details on those, I'm fine with, um, you know, having those that included. 
Um, anybody else have any other thoughts? I guess not. No. I'm good with mine. On the equity, Susan, was it more around the conversation we had been having around having a definition of equity that's shared, or is it more? Um, let's see what I had. Um, just investigate and address shortfalls in creating equity for all students in our district. Show evidence of every child's progress. Um, so that's, you know, it's, it's part of academic achievement. I just think it needs to be specifically kind of. Okay, so we can yeah. cover it when we get into the detail. Okay, understood. And I think, Dave, you maybe had originally some um, a, an equity section of your priorities. Is that right? Wait, you're muted. Yeah, I do. It's absolutely on on my board. Somehow, it didn't migrate into the notes. But you know, forming an equity team is uh, one of my number one priorities uh, after a safe reopening in the curriculum audit. Um, from an academic perspective, I think, you know, it impacts staffing, it impact, impacts hiring, it impacts class, and it impacts curriculum. In fact, we have a sort of a, a small team starting to come together next week around equity. So, yeah, it's one of the my number one priorities. So I'm wondering if we need to add that as, as a board priority as well. Um, in in that list and i yeah I mean, that would that would make some good sense and alignment frankly you know obviously yeah. what the board and the superintendent are focused upon i'm sure the community would say yeah big two thumbs up so i would say let's let's add um that where where, where are you thinking of adding that just to be clear is that on like page two the top board priorities or underneath your priorities that are listed by board member board priorities so what we would like to do here's the goal is we will consolidate all of our priorities into one set of board priorities so i guess that was my original question is on this first page or second page i guess it is where it says board priorities we all need to make sure that you know our individual priorities you know we're we're good with having a set of board priorities that that is these six items and then probably an equity equity team work with you know i don't know how to phrase it dave might have a better um title yeah, yeah i mean i've been thinking about it from an equity team perspective, but um, I think like embedding equity in our DNA is, is kind of where we're trying to get to. Yeah. That's a little lengthy for it, but sort of address, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, make equity part of our culture. Yeah. It could be culture, climate, and equity, right? Right. Yeah. You yeah, know, because right. I look at your board priorities, and then yep. it, it's integral, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I like that. I think that's kind of where we ended up at our meeting, actually, is that it was part of that process, and we we talked about doing the full. Oh, I'm not going to remember the right phrase. It wasn't an equity audit, but it was something close to that. Um, yeah. You know, starting with the definition, and I, I think making it climate, culture, and equity as part of our rather than a separate bullet point, because I see equity in reopening. I mean, there's, yeah. there's a huge equity issue there. There's equity issues in every single bullet point. So, right. Yeah, I mean, and, and to Katie's point, it, it really does have to be part of the DNA. And, and, you know, and it really should become part of, are we addressing equity issues as we tackle every single challenge, right? right. Opening yeah i mean the, you can also the, the apply it, you can also apply it to academic achievement for every kid yeah. well, we also have it as a core yeah. value so you know later on when we list the values the question is is equity a value or is it a priority it, it can it be both you know 
because we, we listed the, the core values are the rules that we play by. I think it can be both. And I think because we have specific things that I, I think we need to do for equity, particularly in this year, that that makes it more of a priority, I would say. Um, so what I would ask about our priorities is if we have these six priorities, we add equity to culture and climate. Um, that's what we would be approving um, in our action item. And then we can, everyone feels good about that. We can move on to a conversation about our values. I'm fine with that. Okay. All right. Um, I guess we also have our vision. So we made a <coughs> statement. And if you have any comments or questions about that, we can talk about that now. And then Jonathan, I think you had an addition to our values. Right? Yeah, the one, this uh, one, remember, I, I had sent out that email basically saying at the end of the meeting when we were reviewing them that um, I think we need to have something about, you know, excellence in teaching or learning or something along those lines um, that, you know, that relates to, you know, that definitely having great teachers and great teaching um, is, is a core value of, of the district. So that's listed as excellence is listed as the last one right now. It does, but it doesn't mention teaching specifically. It mentions just for all of the district. Yeah, we could be specific and say students and teachers or something like that. Well, but yeah. I think when we talked about it, it was every you know it was everything. It was excellence in you know our financial management. It was excellence in you know th throughout anything. The question is, do you say teaching and students and all other areas, or do you just leave it everything? Well, what I had talked about was um, transformative teaching was like the first stab I took at that. Um, and, you know, we had talked about other things like our vision is being fulfilled by passion and experienced teachers who inspire students and love learning if we want to get long. Um, and then I think Dave as well had uh, chimed in with a suggestion that was... Uh, uh, innovative teaching, fearless learning, I think was your suggestion, Dave. So I guess, I don't know that we need to like decide on the exact words now, and I would be happy just saying that we could approve it, like including something along about this in there, that, and then we could agree up on the you know specific language later. But I think it's something that we need to put in there. Okay. You guys all agree. Okay. Sure. Okay. All right, so everybody um, good with that tactic? I, does that mean we don't approve all of this? We don't vote on approving all this tonight? We'll do it tonight. Um, I think we'll do it with some, um, you know, with a few changes and then subject to some changes. Okay. But I think we can go ahead and approve it. Um, okay. Uh, so I think that's that's it. If we, um, I think we need to also talk about next steps a little bit um, as far as the, the things that we went over from our retreat. And part of that is um, how we're moving into the strategic plan planning piece. Um, I mean, we have some some tasks um listed out there anything um and i think that's a probably good timeline if we just start start with the meeting in october um anybody have any other thoughts about some th things that we might need to do before then what what i would like to do sorry um what I'd like to do with our uh, priorities is, Jonathan, I think last year you took our priorities and you made a, a great little checklist with action items. And I think that's what we need to probably do going forward with these. So maybe you could do that again this year. Yeah. That's awesome. That is super. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh -huh. All right. Moving right along. I'll reach out to you. 
feedback. Uh, I mean, just go ahead and send me if you have specific things on each one of those bullet points. And um, I would forward anything in specific, and then I'll consolidate everybody's and throw mine in there and circulate it. Use um, notes from this our our individual board member priorities for me. I mean, I put in some more detail. I think Katie did too. So you might look at look through those. Okay, I'll do that. Um, but thank you. That's awesome. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah. yeah. Take a special Probably. note of my priorities too. Put them at the top. Thank Thanks you. for volunteering, Jonathan. Oh, we always do, Dwayne. We always do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I think we can move on. What I'd like to do now, just because we we had our um, public comments scheduled really early in the meeting, and there I think there might be some public comment that uh, we may have missed then. So I'd like to just reopen public comment right now. So if anybody has a, I'd Scott looks like, Scott, you have, looks like you have your hand up. Hi, thank you. Hi. Sorry if I missed it. If I missed it at the beginning, I apologize. Scott, will um, you just tell? Sorry, will you just tell us your name and I have your email, but we just have to be able to get back to people. Yeah, my name is Scott Ryder. Um, and writer at Sopras.networks. Um, so I had a couple of questions. First of all, I just wanted to make a comment on um, Sarah's 16% weren't that happy. I was one of those. Um, and uh, my answers in that survey weren't directed at the effort that was being made on the, by the teachers. It was directed more at the um, overall experience of learning and um, were grossly dissatisfied with that. I, I'm not necessarily saying or pointing fingers at anyone here, but that's why I answered no. And I wonder how many people answered yes or somewhat um, because they were satisfied with the teacher's effort, but not necessarily satisfied with remote learning. So um, next time there's a survey, they might try to break that out so that you can get a sense of what that's about. Because those numbers that she quoted seem surprisingly high in terms of satisfaction. Um, but those, that was the distinction I made when I answered those questions. So I thought I would just let you know that. Um, so having told you how dissatisfied I am and how frustrated it is for us in our house. Um, I, I'm still and I would I'm trying to figure out who decides this when we go back. How does that decision get made? Who who is the person or persons who say it's time and, and, and what has to happen for that? Um, it, it, so that's my question. I, I can take a run of that. It's a lot of factors go into making the decision. And, you know, we work hand in glove with public health around that decision. So there are guidelines around when you should be returning to school. So, for instance, right now, based on our numbers this afternoon, we're uh, I forget the exact number, but we're above five, which is sort of the threshold of when you should be returning to school. That's the guidance. So, it, you know, part of it's based on public health. Part of it's based on, you know, infection rates, both in our school and in our community. And, you know, so what we're trying to do is transition back um, in a way that kids can thrive and teachers feel safe. So we've had a lot of competing guidance, which has made it extraordinarily hard to make a decision. Um, you know, and sometimes it countermands one another. So the CDC says six feet should be between every kiddo and every teacher. And then Colorado Department of Education says, well, if they're under 11, not only do they not need to wear a mask, but we're not worried about the six feet. So, you know, that gets really kind of hard for us to navigate. 
So we're trying to figure out a way to honor as many of the guidances as possible, right? So CDC says six foot, CDE says, eh, don't worry about it if they're under a certain age. And since they came out with that guidance, you know, there's been new research emerging about viral loads and, and you know, whether younger students can transmit COVID. And you know, so we're getting lots of competing uh, directions. So where we are now, we are now is that if we get, if we get two, two weeks of, you know, blue, which used to be green, but now it's blue. And even there, it gets confusing on the state guideline it's green and on the the county ones the in our valley the guidance is blue you know that's the uh, protect your neighbor status which is safer right and so if we had two weeks of that then we can start transitioning back and that's kind of our plan so we're really hoping that the covid needle here drops back down and we're going to begin preparing for you know, bringing our secondary students back to school. And and to your point about distance learning that you opened with, every single person here recognizes that distance learning is not the ideal, is not what we want for our kids. And it's much harder to deliver quality instruction in distance learning. It, it's really, it, even pre-COVID, the cyber charter schools across the nation the professionals really struggled with delivering high quality content that was meaningful and engaging for the students. It's really not for all. So we recognize that as well. Um, it, it's definitely not the preferred model of teaching. Thank you, David. And by yeah. the way, welcome, welcome. And thank you for taking on this, uh, taking on this effort. Um, I appreciate it and look forward to meeting you in person someday. Yeah, likewise. But, yeah, likewise. but following, following up on that, I mean, I guess it sounds like it's a very subjective ruling and that different counties use different measures. I mean, I, you know, I, I understand Garfield County has opened their schools. Um, I'm not sure. I didn't check their, their Corona meter before coming on to this meeting. I don't know how much worse or better they are than us. Um, some of our schools are open, some of them aren't. Um, and, and so for me, I wonder if we couldn't take a more uh, aggressive path towards opening and, and, and perhaps show more of a leadership element in this rather than sitting back and waiting for the magic Corona meter to move. So I, I think uh, uh, that was sort of the guidance we got tonight that we need to plan for a best case scenario. Um, and so, you know, the rest of the conversation is that it's hugely political, right? So in Garfield, um, that superintendent, when she pushed hard for a mask ordinance was threatened and, and you know, she thought she, you know, candidly thought she was worried about her life. Uh, fortunately, we don't have that problem here. Um, you know, we have other challenges here, right? So, you know, as, as I said, we're trying really hard to ensure, you know, that the teachers feel safe and that kids are going to have an environment in which they can thrive. And I'm guardedly optimistic that you're going to see, you know, more and more students on campus sooner rather than later. You know, I can't I, I can't give you a hard date because that is the Corona meter is part of the conversation. Um, and oddly, Garfield's Corona meter, where they have a lot more Corona than we do up here, uh, is in the blue as of this afternoon. So I'm, I'm really unclear at this point how we shifted into yellow from being in blue. Um, and, and so. You know, there is there is there is a subjectivity to it, um, but there is no final decider, really. Maybe it's me, kind of, except that, you know, it's a team really trying to drive this forward, to be candid. Uh, and we're trying to do it in a way that's safe. And, you know, we've got 
parents on this committee. We've got teachers on this committee. We've got administrators on this committee. Uh, the committee was supposed to be really small, but when you add all those people together, it got up to around 25, 26 people instead of the original 15. So that's some of the challenge to, to reopening. <clears throat> and I also, I, I feel like when we got very specific about opening the elementary school and how, how that was going to happen, and we came up with very detailed um, plans and procedures, that gets us a lot closer to being able to open and to people feeling comfortable with it being open. So I think that's what we will then proceed to do with the middle school and the high school. And, you know, it should take less time because we've we've done it with the elementary school but um you know that that's part of the process well i i'm sorry i i'll just make this last ask this last question or comment um the cdc data that i've been following suggests that people you know the people who are severely at risk are much older and have 2.6 comorbidities in terms of the death rate. And those that are like under, I can't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, 50, under 55 with no comorbid, comorbidities. I mean, there's very little risk for those people. And, and pick up both I appreciate, on the I appreciate what back. you said. I appreciate what you said, Susan, but um, you know, if people are worried, I mean, I get that. I'm, I'm not trying to discount that at all. But for those who don't have the core morbidities and are willing to take the risk, uh, which to me seems very, very small, um, why can't we have those people in school? That's what we're working for. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, Scott, good inputs, good inputs. Thank you, Appreciate thank you. your uh, following us. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, we are now moving to our next. Um, what, were there other public comments? I should ask that. Catherine, did you have a public comment? Because I can't hear you. It doesn't look like you're muted, but for some reason I can't hear you. Turn up your volume, maybe. You could type in the chat. And I can read it. <laughs> Susan, you must have had a great education. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Perhaps take another public comment while she's typing. Is there other public comment? Don't see any. Okay. Pressure's on, Catherine. <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> um, you know what we could do actually is just um, go to our next agenda item and then just circle back to Catherine. So, Susie, huh? this is review change policies discussion, and um, so just. Before before you start, <clears throat> I will just sort of go through what I think um, should be our process for this. Um, and so if we have a potential policy that we would like to change, I think that it's helpful if um, you do a sort of a sample change or even just tell us what policy it is so that we can read the policy beforehand 
then when we are in our meeting, we can discuss it. Then um, we would type up the change and then we would approve it at a subsequent meeting. But um, go right ahead. And if any anybody else has others, um, we can kind of do an overview, but we've got a little time here now, Susie. Great. So I just, um, over the last, uh, three years or so, I've just kind of kept track of the ones that didn't make sense to us or that I thought we had outgrown or uh, things had changed and they didn't work for us anymore. So briefly, um, uh, I'm just going to highlight, I had a couple of, I would say there are four that are so minor, I didn't want to waste our time tonight. I, I could just put those in writing. But the ones I felt um, a little more strongly about were, um, let's say, BSR3, where it says the board will view superintendent performance as being identical to organizational performance. I just thought, yeah, thank you, Dwayne. Uh, I just thought, you know, <laughs> thank you, Dave. <laughs> um, if we're not doing such a good job, that's not necessarily the new person on the block's fault. So I just thought we might that might want to just delete that line um, in BSR. Um, so just I have a comment just about that a little bit. Um, I think even we could even go further that um, I mean, we want our superintendent to actually look at the district performance with a very um, critical eye for ways to improve. So um, instead of it, you know, just reflecting his his performance, it should actually be, you know, how can we make this better and a very honest and, and forthright look at that. So I don't know how um, we could we could phrase that in a way that encourages, um, you know, critical look at, at our performance, but I think that's what we're looking for. Yeah, I think we have consensus there. We've briefly spoken about this as a board in the past, right? It, that, that, that direct connection that Susie uh, speaks to creates this bizarre change in uh, behaviors and motivations at the leader level, uh, and it's not to the benefit of the organization. So there's this kind of death spiral that one could see occurring over time. And so the decoupling of that, we probably don't need to wordsmith it tonight, but clearly Susie would like to write that up in a new format. <laughs> thank you, Susie. And, yep. uh, <laughs> you know, we're obviously take a crack at it. We can respond to it at, a, at the next meeting. That's great. Right. I think that would be great. Okay. Um, and then BSR 5, um, number one, where it says information not formally presented as monitoring data and that does not contribute directly to this purpose is not considered monitoring data. But we've had such problems with our monitoring data and it's been so random and taken so much of our time in board meetings and really didn't translate into improved student performance, teacher performance. It just, I, it, I think that to say that certain data qualifies and other data doesn't qualify and you can't consider a great touching story where somebody did something it just seems that it's too um too strict um and i would just delete that one line i could i would, could keep the first line in that number which says monitoring de determines the degree to which board policies are being met so i would say um what will be helpful for this is if you could um, get Eliza to give us a red line of, of all of these changes when we go back to approve them, then we'll be able to look through and go, okay, you want this part in, but you want this part out. Um, then we can look at it and, and just approve it. But I think, yeah, I, that makes sense. Okay. And then um, BSR 5E, we say by October 15th, and we keep not making that deadline, at least since I've been a board member. And I would just maybe change it to annually. The board will conduct a uh, evaluation of the superintendent. Sure. Okay. 
I think, I guess my only concern is the reason that it's hard to make is that it's just hard to get around to it and gather the information and set a meeting and all that. And without a deadline, it might be even more difficult. Mm. Um, and if you and if you recall, Susan, it also falls right. It falls somewhat in the season of that of that pattern of uh, monitoring and monitoring. Mm, yeah, uh, that's so it kind of gets covered up by other you know, important work efforts. So it's the timing, the timing of it also feels weird in the context of the contract uh, schedule, July first contract. Yeah. How does it correspond to compens any compensation or contract reviews? I mean, that's how the review should correspond, right? Not just be some arbitrary date. Yeah. We count, yeah, we count the amount of A's that are earned by K through 12 students, and then we multiply <laughs> that by his pennies. That's what he gets. There you go. <laughs> I meant not I didn't mean student reviews, Dwayne. <laughs> No, I just, I mean, typically management, you don't just have a review at a random time. It has a purpose of, you know, and. Yeah, well, it should be driving, right. It should be driving organizational goals and objectives. So the timing of it in the middle of October is kind of awkward and gooey. So I, you know, I kind of, I would think it'd be out in the spring, frankly, when we have more data and more analysis that we're seeing in the year for the year. And remember the other dynamic of the policy. Yeah, and knowledge. it was always. Yeah, backwards looking. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I think, has, sorry, I, I think we just need to review this whole section of how this works because it, there, there, it's fraught. There are, there, I, I think just cherry picking line items in this section is, is um, problematic. I think we, if we're going to look at it, we should look at the whole section and. Okay. And which, is, which is something that we then need, you know, a, a whole good hour. To, to probably talk about this section. And we can take pieces of our policies and do that. We just need to put it on an agenda and do that. Um, and I think part of the background would be, um, we also want to talk with Dave, what works for him? How does the, how can we, you know, incentivize? How can we, you know, what what is going to work best? And so there's a little bit of homework, I would say, to, to this as well. So let's put that on a future agenda item. And, and where does this fall in our priorities as listed? Just checking, because we just set the priorities. I want to make sure that if we're going to- Board governance on. is high. Board governance. Very high. Okay. Right in there. Touchdown. Perfect. Katie, I um, chose the most egregious things. I wouldn't mind throwing the whole thing out, but I decided to narrow it down to the most egregious. Should I continue or not continue? I only have a few more. Are they in the same- um, the same area, BS. Which I mean, G, then my next one is GP one. Uh, one bullet point to delete in GP one. Okay, B the BSR we will tackle as a another agenda item. The G G. What did you just say? GP. Which number? One. Yeah, go ahead and go through that one because it might be quick. Okay, last bullet. Um. <coughs> It's not so much a change. Well, I'm sorry. The fifth bullet needs to be changed to his and her. We had changed a bunch of other things to his and her. So okay. We may have to change it to a third pronoun, but for now, let's maybe stick with at least his and her from just his. Um, and you can send that Eliza. That that's great. Yep. And then um, the last bullet. It's not so much a change that I recommend, but I wonder when it's in violation and we don't talk about or we don't talk about it may I, I guess it's a discussion to have at some point it says successful teams trust authority and respect and value the contributions of each member now i think the team includes like the the whole school doesn't it the whole district yeah I, so so when there is some maybe disrespect or or something that feels like disrespect, like that would, I think that would be considered of a, a part of this GP and and I feel like it's an opportunity to re do some education where, for example, in that bullet, 
um, there was a, a, a chat comment in one of our board meetings that questioned why the board was getting involved in instruction. And so I pulled out where the constitution of the Colorado State says that the boards of education shall have control of instruction in the public schools of their districts. And I thought maybe we should mention that every once in a while, that our job does include instruction. So it doesn't come across as disrespectful when we talk about instruction and talk about it even for more hours than we might even discuss HVAC. There was well, that might be a good when we monitor that policy, that would be a good thing to bring up. So then moving along, um, I had GP2. Um, I thought that my experience with the books that are recommended that would for to hand out to all new candidates, boards that matter and good governance is a choice. If we're not going to be choosing that team to be govern helping with our policy governance, we should probably re remove that line from yeah. GP two four A, and I yeah. would recommend deleting that. Okay. Thumbs up for me. <laughs> Say that again. Thumbs up. I I yeah. And then in um, GP7, I didn't know if this was a state requirement that we have the preschool council, but we don't, uh, do we need a board member? It was one of the, this is all the committee structures. And I didn't know if we needed, if we feel that we need a board member on the preschool council or not. Uh, that was a very minor comment. I also in that statute though, we have all these directions for the DAC, which are go way above and beyond what the stat statute requires. And we did that about right before I joined because w the board thought the, the DAC was kind of naughty and needed to rein them in and spelled it all out with what they do in March, what they do in April, what they do in May, what they can't do in December. So just redline it and yeah. send it to the line. Okay. Yep. And then mm, I thought that, say that again, Dwayne. No, I'll just say naughty. It was Jonathan that was really yeah. naughty. <laughs> okay, sorry, keep going. <laughs> and then um, the FAB, I'm so excited that we have a refurbished FAB. It says in our, in our statute, in our policy, it says quarterly. And I would love for them to meet monthly <laughs> or report monthly. Yeah, so we, we are meeting monthly and we are potentially covering more topics than are listed Ooh. on that. So that's something that needs to be reviewed and approved. Great. 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 Okay. okay. Awesome. And, and then in GP 7A, I have never liked um, GP 7A 2C, where it says criticize privately, praise publicly. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, yeah, I think the criticized public uh, privately is funny, but go on. Yes. So the Roaring Fork Leadership or Aspen Leadership Program that I believe Dwayne maybe have done and has done and other people has done this leadership program. Don't they say um, be critical of the issue, hard on the issues, but not on the people? And yeah. I would change criticize privately praise publicly to be critical of issues, not of individuals. Yeah. If we had to. I would change it. Yeah, I like that. Okay. But doesn't it also say that we have to tell Dave anything anybody ever tells us to or something? <laughs> I told you I chose the most egregious things. That was okay. You go find that one, Katie, and send it to Eliza too. <laughs> I have no idea. But do we circle back to Catherine? Is it, are we there yet? Yeah, okay. there? Hold on, Dwayne. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Susie, you need to make sure that Eliza has all of these changes so she can put them back um, on our agenda next time so that we can then approve them. Right. I'll um, do that. Okay. And I would suggest include, including the not as egregious, just slightly egregious ones as well. You know, I, I, when we go, we might not get through the whole thing at once, but, you know, I think if okay. we, well, we need to eventually. 
the original and then the red line and right. then we can decide that's what we want to do. I've spent two years trying to figure out how to do that and I had to just print it all and do my own edits on Great. So. Well, thank you. Did I tell you about GP8 or, or stop? Just put it in there. Okay. And we'll look at it. We're good. <laughs> um, okay. So um, that's the end of that agenda item. We'll move forward on that the next meeting. Catherine, do you want to try to speak again and see if we can hear you? No. Okay. I'll read your comment. All right. Um, Catherine says they've missed so much school since mid March. Parent since mid March, parents are scratching their heads about how we can be meeting standards with hybrid and online learning. School days are shorter, and there's basically no instruction on Wednesday for elementary and middle schoolers. Look, look, she had two more comments above that got above. lost. Let yeah, me read yeah, those. Um, I'd like to follow up as the main concern is getting our kids properly educated. Is there some consideration of extending the calendar if kids aren't getting enough educational hours? And then a little later on, right now, elementary kids are attending two days a week with no direct teaching beyond that. They can't possibly be getting enough instruction time to learn what they're supposed to learn by the end of the school year. Can we eliminate holidays and or add days at the end of the school year if our students are not meeting academic goals? Also, can parents get some communication about how their kids are doing compared to grade level expectations? And then the one that you read, so. Okay. So, um, Dave, do you wanna just address that real quick? Sure, I mean, and Chris is still on here so he can join in. Um, there is intention of education on Wednesdays. Uh, Chris was telling me that it is occurring online. Um, you know, it, it's not an ideal schedule by any stretch, and it is also under review, right? So there is the intention that work is being provided on the off days so that the students are continuing to grow. Um, there's the intention of the two days of instruction. And then, you know, I know that we've got problems with scheduling PD on Wednesdays, because teachers are delivering instruction at both uh, the elementary and the middle schools, that they are booked in doing that. And that's you know kind of what I was informed. Chris is right here. Uh, Chris, would you like to talk to this a little bit? Oh, and, and we are continuing to look at the calendar because A, we started late, we pushed back the start of elementary by a week. We recognize that. So we are looking at the days. Um, <clears throat> and the calendar from making up and continuing learning opportunities for kids. The other thing too is before Chris weighs in on the current schedule is that we do hope to get the school back in its entirety sooner rather than later. And that's part of the reason for, you know, spending lots of money on air cleansing and, and that sort of thing. So Chris, can you talk to some of Catherine's concerns? Well, sure. I mean, <clears throat> yesterday, for instance, there was um, a minimum of two and a half hours. There was an hour of art. There was an hour of music. There was a half hour classroom meeting. And then there was time designated <clears throat> for our teachers to talk to our students about the work that they had signed that they would be doing remotely if they were part of cohort A and also in pre preparing cohort B for their first day of school. So um, it is it's always being looked at um, in terms of rigor and hours and trying to make sure that we're keeping connected to the kids um, on that middle day of the week, which is again, <clears throat> laying the groundwork for what's going to be happening for kids that are coming into school for Thursday and Friday, and also tying up loose ends with the first cohort in terms of things that had been assigned and questions that they had had, in addition to giving instruction for synchronous or asynchronous assignments um, that can be accomplished by the kids who are working remotely on uh, Thursday and Friday. But it's very much a work in progress. It can get better, and it will. 
Thanks, Chris. Um, thank you, Catherine. Appreciate you. Um, anybody else have any public comment? Okay, we're going to move to our next agenda item, which is um, 6.3, the equity committee or team. And I um, just would like just a brief, very brief update, Dave, just on what your um, vision is for this group and, and what where you see it going and when and whatnot. Um, sure. It's basically a team that would address equity issues uh, made up of uh, administrators, staff, students. Uh, we've got a planning meeting scheduled for, I want to say, Wednesday afternoon uh, with some of the staff that are really um, interested in this issue. And so they're going to help us lay the groundwork moving forward. So we would like to bring to the board by the, I think we said the final meeting in October, uh, sort of an equity team uh, plan with actual work and goals moving forward for the district. But an equity team can help review curricular materials to make sure that it's inclusive and appropriate. It can help uh, look at hiring policies and practices to make sure that we're inclusive and that it becomes part of the DNA there. Uh, it can look at, you know, our recruiting efforts for staffing and that sort of thing. So it becomes pretty important. Um, it can help put together professional development around implicit bias, uh, which is certainly something that we all um, have to at least be aware of. So it, that is the work of an equity team. And I think that that's a good start to start addressing some of the issues that have, you know, kind of been brought to my attention uh, while I'm here. Great. Any questions for Dave? No, I'm fully supportive of this concept and, you know, then eventually rolling it out to, you know, students as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, student student voice, I think, has to be an integral part of this conversation and this work moving forward. And and districts that are really addressing these issues are uh, there's a place at the table for the students. Absolutely. Can you give us, with obviously anonymously, but the, uh, some two or one or two or three topics that have risen to the top of their concern? Um. Well, there's been concern about. Uh, support. There's been concern of um, sort of stipends and things like that being inequitably dispersed. I mean, even from the housing conversation that we continue to have, there were many allegations of, you know, a clap on the back and you get uh, priority housing. So, you know, we're really, and Linda is really kind of got this this club as she calls it but they're really working at making sort of the housing uh as equitable as possible right so that's a huge piece of it right there so those are a couple of the issues that have been brought to my attention okay um thank you dave sure all right let's move to gp8e um Eliza, do we have anything to, oh, I, we need to um, confirm the time for our September 21st meeting. Correct. If we're going to have it um, 8 a.m. or if we're going to keep the 4 p.m. It sounded like it works best for most everyone to be at 4 p.m. Is that, was that correct? Yeah. My yeah. idea. <laughs> And there was a comment about with the online learning model that it would be easier to keep it at 4 p.m. You yeah. know, especially if we're doing the meetings virtually. Uh, it'd be easier to get the, the, the principles there. Dave, do you? I, I, I agree. I mean, especially, I think the principles are uh, an important part of the conversation. 
and it gets much easier at four o'clock. Okay. So let's go with four o'clock. I'd like a motion to, do we need to change it, Eliza? Is this a change? Yeah. Are you changing it permanently for the rest of the year? I would prefer a motion, but if it's just this meeting. Yeah, let's change it for the rest of the year. And then if we need to adjust again, we can do that. Okay. And is this a virtual meeting just to be clear before we vote on it? No. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I that think would, it's that would be my recommendation as of now. The guidance is that we should be doing as much as possible virtually. Um, I, I just, uh, okay. as much as possible, we try to meet virtually. Uh, we try to internally meet virtually when we can. Um, it, it, you, you know. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's easier for everyone to see us and hear us at this point. I want to yeah. you know, make sure that we are reiterating that our goal is to be in person. Our goal is to have equipment so that we can be in person and also have a, a, a remote session with. <laughs> so, um, that's the that's where we're headed but i would say for this meeting let's let's go ahead and plan on remote and then um let's also i would also take a motion to move the meeting time for all of our regular meetings going forward to 4 p.m so two or one motion anybody want to? I, just I, one. I With both yeah i move, I move all the meetings to four o'clock um, Second. Okay. Okay. I'll do a quick roll call. Katie Frisch. Aye. Susan Merrill. Aye. Jonathan Nickel. Aye. Dwayne Romero. Aye. And Susie Zimmett. Aye. So moved. Thank you. Okay. Um, board priorities, mission, and values. So I would make a our, take a motion to approve these priorities and our mission and values with a an addition of um, equity as a board priority and an addition of um, teaching excellence um, to our values. Is that right, Jonathan? Yep, that's fine. Okay. Um, so I would I would ask for that motion. So moved. Second. Okay. Katie Frisch. Aye. Who's in the roll? Aye. Jonathan Nickel? Aye. Dwayne Romero? Aye. And Susie Zimmett? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Um, Needle Point Bipolar Ionization Contract. We heard about this from Linda. Does anyone have any other questions for her or for Dave? Um, this is great news vis a vis, like you said, on the pre versus the previous numbers and scope. Yeah. So, this is great news. Yeah, awesome. appreciate the previous review. I'm comfortable. Yeah. Um, all right, Jonathan, did you have something? No, oh, all good. Um, I'll take a motion to approve the contract as presented. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Katie Frisch? Aye. Susan Roll? Aye. Jonathan Nickel? Aye. Dwayne Romero? Aye. And Susie Zimmett? Aye. All right. Thank you. So moved. Um, I'd like a motion to approve our consent action items as presented. Anyone? So moved. So moved. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Okay. Um, Katie Frisch. Aye. Susan Merrill. Aye. Jonathan Nickel. Aye. Dwayne Romero. Aye. And Susie Zimmett. Aye. And a special shout out to Jonathan for helping me with some of these minutes this time. <laughs> Thank well you done. for the advice. As well. <laughs> I had help. Okay. Um, future meeting um, work session topics. One of which is um, to approve, uh, to look over and approve Susie's changes to policies and. Um
as a separate agenda item, we will go through the BSR um, policies and um, Eliza, if you could post both of those as you know part of our reading material, so everybody reads through them, and then we should all just make notes about um, you know how we think it should go. I think I may have some questions just about you know um, how maybe they do the superintendent review in other districts, that sort of thing. So um, we may need to ask questions beforehand, but. Um, that will be a future agenda item. Anybody else have any um, future agenda items other than what we just normally have on our GPA? Did, did, did we include Jonathan's rewriting of the details of the priorities? No. Yes. That's okay. a idea. Um, Jonathan, uh, that's a future agenda item. If you could go through and give us a task list and um, we'll, we'll review it and give you some feedback and we really appreciate that. That's very helpful. Such a nice volunteer. Really? <laughs> hey, I did have a question, Susan, about the, yeah. um, in terms of the policy work, um, you know, my thought has always been, it's not so much what's written in the policies that was the issue. It's much more about how those are interpreted. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, I mean, we could rewrite it, um, but if there's not a clear understanding between the board and Dave, how they, you know, what the expectation is of the interpretation of that policy, then I think we're going to continue to really not advance very far and stub our toes. So I just don't know how we, you know, I know we got a lot of other stuff going on and all those things, but I just, uh, I think that's the real key work that we have to work on together with Dave. So just put it on, you know, yeah, if we can right. put it on there. So and I have one question related to that, Jonathan. We we talked, uh, and I cannot remember the name of the woman who we had our offsite with um, right now, but we had talked about her coming back again maybe in December, but we hadn't quite decided what exactly the topic would be. Did we talk about we put that on as a future thing? Our, our facilitator, Ann Delahant? Yes. Okay. I think she was going to, Dave, was she going to come back and, and help us with strategic planning a little bit? Yes. Okay. So we were going to begin to operationalize some of the work that we had done at the offsite and then, you know, next steps in the grid and start moving it forward. And then she was going to come along and help us fine tune that work, sort of an accountability partner, if you will. Yeah. An independent accountability partner. So, does this work that Jonathan's talking about that we've been talking about? How does that fit? Does it fit into that at all? Or because we did read that book for the offsite, so <laughs> right. I just was kind of wondering yeah. how, from a time frame and what we're trying to accomplish, when we want to try to block some of this in. Yeah, and maybe I was just thinking. I think we need to give a clear expectation to Dave um as to what we expect out of i mean because we have all these policies in the past we did all the monitoring under the current conditions i don't think monitoring is probably the best use of the time um of, of the staff and everybody with all that's going on especially now working when we're trying to get school started again um but i think we should at least you know have clear what our expectation is uh, of how we're gonna modify that the way it was normally done before um so maybe that's something a couple of us need to think about or or maybe just kind of go through the policies and say what do we expect from dave are we i mean we can monitor our own ones like the board ones but i don't know that r1 policy review as it had been done traditionally right now at this this moment is is you know the best use of anybody's time so no i agree I, so maybe we should just we need to set a clear expectation to Dave and come to an agreement on what it is we would like to see then. You know, like, so it sounds like what Theron is talking about getting the star stuff together is like, you know, that's the kind of academic um, information we need to be able to, for the district to be able to analyze our progress and all those things. Um, but kind of like, that's the baseline, but I don't know how we, I guess maybe we need to have a work session or something and maybe it could just be Dave proposing something. 
um, to you, Susan, and then kind of look at it and then maybe come back to the rest of us. But just so there's a clear expectation so we don't end up in um, when we have to review performance in July, that there's there's some kind of uh, clear metric of what we what it is we want to review. So I would propose two things. I think mm -hmm. if we go through the BSR, which is what we currently have, and we we just look through that and we have a, a agenda item to discuss that first and how we might want to look look at that going forward. I think we're going to need something specific for this year, um, maybe to to do our our evaluation for this year. And so, yeah, I think it's a, it would be a good idea to for Dave to kind of give us some um, what would be reasonable expectations of, of what, you know, how we could measure what happened during the year and his performance and whatnot. And then we could have a work session to talk about that as well. Does that sound? Yeah, maybe, and maybe just then a, a suggestion from Dave on what are his priorities and what would be the best way to you know, have, have an objective way to measure that. Yeah. So when we get to Ju June, um, then we could hopefully say, okay, check, here's here's how we did. Yeah, I think that sounds good. Okay. Um, Dave, does that sound okay to you? <laughs> it does. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll work with you and we'll take a look at that. And, you know, we'll, we'll also crosswalk it to the contract because there's some language in there around evaluation. Oh, good. And, okay. uh, that sort of thing. But, you know, having measurable goals and, and having, you know, some priorities uh, and lining those up really helps because, you know, Theron and I've already begun talking about goals for our cabinet team, our leadership team, and we want we want to line them up. Right. And, and so, yeah. you know, two of my major goals are around literacy and numeracy instruction in the district. And, you know, consequently, two of Theron's goals around literacy and numeracy. And right. consequently, two of Chris Bastian's goals are, will be around literacy and numeracy. And you can kind of see, uh, sure. so I'm trying to really get everything lined up like that. And um, so that, you know, I would really far rather talk a lot more about literacy and numeracy than HVAC stuff. Um, <laughs> because that will soon be in the rear view mirror. Yep. And we will have to, we will continue to grapple with literacy and numeracy and, and to, you know, Catherine's points. These are huge concerns right now. And yep. uh, we, we all share them. And, and, you know, to, and so I really want the whole team kind of lined up around that sort of goal structure. So absolutely. Okay. It's definitely Great. the way to move forward. So Eliza, that will be another future agenda item. Um, would be a, a board work session around superintendent evaluation for this this school year. Um, what? Just one more to add, which is calendar scheduling for the board meetings. You know, through the academic year, um, they're not in the calendar, at least that I see in Google Calendar. Um, I might be using it wrong, but um, my my concern is mostly related to the change in the um, CASB conference and what December, end of November, December is going to look like based on the fact that that conference is happening virtually. And if we're going to try, given that it's a super busy time of year, I think we should just try to plan out what those dates are now, if we can, yeah. not today, but at the next meeting. And actually we need to have that as a future agenda item also is whether we want to use our money to attend that conference virtually or do we think there's a better way to spend our money with someone coming to us in person maybe, or I don't know what, or specific to us or whatever. So let's um, put that as a future item to discuss too, Eliza, please. Okay, any others? Yeah, we'll obviously want to, uh, under the category of an assumptive positive close on the boat, uh, we're gonna want to have a work session with Gilbert and Kari and obviously fire up the um, detailed advanced planning for the parts and pieces of uh, that program for facilities master planning as well as housing, et cetera, et cetera. So there's going to be a series okay. of that work. Okay. So just, I, it, it's not for the next 30 to 45, obviously, but it could be 60 to 75 days out that yep. we want to get that going again. Keep it on the radar. 
Well, and also if it were to unfortunately go the other way, we would need a work session on what we're going to do um, for any of those measures. Yeah. So sure. we could probably schedule that work session as a post vote, you know, work yeah. session. Cool. Cool. Yep. Okay. All right, Eliza, do you feel like you have <laughs> all of these that we've been throwing at you? Yes. Um, one question comes up for next meeting for the um, BSR policies. How much time would you like allotted to that topic? Um, I think 30 minutes if we've got it all spelled out in front of us. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Okay, anything else? Uh, Dwayne, it is your turn to debrief our meeting. Debriefed it last time, but I'll do it again this time. This is cool. Um, <laughs> so in terms of staying on topic and staying on task and staying in pace, uh, we as a group, you know, obviously we pre appreciate all the participation and the constructive uh, feedback to and fro with the, with the leadership team. That's super powerful. I like the fact that we are also able to kind of circle back and keep the public engaged in the conversation. We want to continue those. Uh, I remember we set as a board uh, priority to, to be more responsive uh, and open and uh, engage a bit more in the dialogue during our business meetings with the public. So I thought that was that's excellent. We're, uh, you know, we're right at pace. We're right under three hours. That's, that's also somewhat productive. Um, so overall, in terms of you know policy governance and the process of being good, effective governors, good work. And again, my, my hat's off. I'm sure I speak for the entire board when I say hats off to all the staff and the leadership for uh, preparing and participating to the community for continuing to advance our goals together. So it's a, it's a good meeting. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Dwayne. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I will now take a motion to adjourn our meeting at 6.58. A move. Second it. Thank you, everyone. Nope. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Mute button. Do we need to? No? Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Thank you. everybody. Appreciate it. Where's leave? How come I can't find leave? Everything's moving.